Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 589. That's 589 of the Agostino Zynga Show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may be finding you. I hope you are doing fine and dandy. How am I? Pretty, pretty good, all things considered. I should be in a far better place, but I'm slowly but surely getting to the place that I know and love. The place of serenity, the place of peace, the place of contentment, and the place of just bliss. And I'm slowly getting there, slowly but surely. If you've been wondering where I've been, I've been busy really with outside life. I've been working a bunch. I've been working out a bunch. I've been sweating indoors a bunch. (laughs) And I've been generally just living life. It's been an absolute crazy couple of weeks here in London with the weather and stuff. I know most of you are probably tired of hearing, especially if you're from here. But if you're not, we've had a crazy heat wave, which I think most of Europe has had too. Um, It's been crazy, crazy warm to the point where you start to really kind of contemplate your own existence. And it wouldn't be that much of an issue in other places. But this country isn't really set up for heat. Everywhere you go from the houses you live in to the shops you go to frequent to the public transport that you use. There's nothing that is kind of suited or suitable for heat. I dare, I dare to imagine what restaurants are like these days because for the most part, the insulation of how they design buildings nowadays in the UK, because it's mostly cold, they try to make them fairly well insulated so you don't have to rack up crazy charges with the heat when it's in the colder months. Um, for the most part, most places, with the exception of only maybe a few, have actual work in air conditioning. So you're essentially going into places just hoping you don't sweat your balls off and then hoping you can run outside quickly as possible. So this country isn't really set up in a way to kind of accommodate that. And I think the majority, I'd say, even of households or even public buildings in the UK are probably made up of carpet. So there's carpet everywhere. That's obviously absorbing a lot of heat. And it's just really, really muggy and mist. Like it's, it's humid, it's sticky, it's horrible. And it's just is a very unpleasant experience to be in. So especially in my apartment where I live in now, it's a fairly new build, like, you know, mid 2000s or whatnot, um, or early 2000s, let's say. And they obviously have insulated this place fairly well because in the winter times, I hardly, if ever, turn up my heating. So I save a lot of money on that. But when it comes to the summer months, I've got really thick double glazing that really helps with the noise um, reduction or noise pollution, whatever it may be, on the outside of my window because I live next to a busy street. So it helps with that. But then when it's really warm, having the windows closed, it basically acts like a magnifying glass for the heat inside. So when you open it, you then get all the rays beaming inside and you've got no heat coming. You've got no kind of cool air coming back in. But luckily enough, hopefully, I should be getting my um, air con- sorry, my, uh, my fan sorted out fairly soon. I did get some help with that with the people in the chat from my random show were contributing enough um, on there in terms of Super Chat. So I'm going to be able to get my... Um, my fan delivered to me very soon that was very very nice of them i didn't ask for it i just mentioned i was going i'm really hot in here and i wanted to get a fan and people started contributing to the fan funds so that was really nice so i'm gonna get that sorted but even then i don't know if that's gonna be enough do you know what i mean for the kind of um sticky square apartment i tend to live in i think most people have even got it worse so i pray for everybody out there in the uk who's been suffering from the heat i've heard that people such collapsing due to heat stroke and stuff because we're just not built for it we are definitely not built for it. it's like when i went to nicaragua at that time i went traveling to central america for a bit to visit a friend and for some reason i assumed i was like black black like african black when in actuality i'm not i'm european black right my skin isn't conditioned um for the burning hot temperature so i went to that country with absolutely no sunscreen thinking i could just you know sit in the sun and be okay and i came back and my whole forehead was crackly like it was burnt to shit i burnt my arms i burnt my feet burnt my legs the first time i realized oh shit i didn't know black people could actually get sunburned i was like oh yeah shit not all black people are created equal do you know what i mean the guys who are actually from africa and live there and um, live and breathe there work out with their tops off run around on the beach and just hang out and shit their melanin is completely different to mine um and i got a rude awakening when that happened and i think this is my rude awakening here in the uk in terms of we are just not built for the sun even the public transport I remember hearing some reports over the weekend that certain lines were basically closed because it was so hot. I even saw a post recently on Twitter about Supreme closing a couple of days ago because it was too warm. The retail store in London closed its doors for a day because it was too warm, which you have to imagine is a big step for them because I'd imagine even on the off day, they probably make a a, a decent amount of money per day through the till through tourists just coming in just wanting to pick something up and say they've been at the supreme store do you know what i mean so for them to close it must mean it was absolutely hell on earth in that retail store and i imagine i remember when it was me and i used to work retail back in the day 
one of the worst months of the year was always the summer right the summer season was always the worst because it was always the sale times and it was always really hot the customers were always really kind of cranky and angry because it was hot and warm especially the parents and families were there with little kids and shit driving them crazy and then here i am coming down the stairs saying i don't have any more size eights do you know what i mean of course they're gonna be angry so that was usually some of the worst months to work in a retail store you're sticky you're hot you're sweaty you're running up and down stairs to get shoes you're restocking stuff it's just awful so yeah god bless everybody out there thoughts and prayers go out to everybody out there who's on the retail floor who's in bars who's working in kitchens now who's serving all that stuff oh god i can't imagine how difficult it must be it's hard enough for me working from home in a really humid damp sort of like you know apartment but at least i'm at home do you know what i mean imagine having to be in a kitchen somewhere with the heat coming off from the fryer or from the pan and shit like god damn it from the stove whatever it may be it must be horrendous 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 but yeah here we are here we are Anyway, we've begun to show many things to talk about, so I want to crack on, don't want to waste much of your time. First story I wanted to talk about, my, you know, a kind of brief one to touch upon concerning my club, Man United, and concerning our, um, you know, main point of attack in Cristiano Ronaldo. I'm kind of enjoying this new kind of Man United direction that Eric Ten Hag has kind of taken us into, which I think someone mentioned the other day was um, more in the line of accountability. He's basically putting the ownership and the onus back on the players as opposed to the team and the club and the board and whatnot and manager. It's all about the players. Do they want it enough? Are they hungry to win titles? Do they want to put their best foot forward? Do they want to entertain the fans? Do they want to create extraordinary moments, bring the best of themselves on the pitch? Blah, 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 blah. And so far, there's been a lot of drama around Cristiano Ronaldo right because he came back to the club under the premise that he was going to you know get us back to winning ways and get us a challenge for the title and being amongst the champions league and it didn't really work out because fundamentally our team was broken before he even arrived right many many years ago the expectation levels have kind of dropped um the, st the, the quality the standards of quality have obviously dropped um and it's just basically a bit of a shell of a club of what he kind of left but then he came in hoping to kind of you know pull us kicking and streaming pull us kicking and screaming or streaming screaming over the line and it didn't quite work out and we ended up finishing outside the top four and by all intents and purposes i immediately thought as soon as we finished outside the top four even though ronaldo signed a two-year contract with the option of a further one year so basically a three-year contract i was always under the assumption that if we didn't finish in the champions league at least in the first season that he stayed at the club that he was at the club sorry i was under the impression who was going to leave because Cristiano Ronaldo never struck to me as a player who was kind of like not not Ibrahim is probably a bad example because he's a bit older than him, but he didn't strike me as a player who was looking to have a swan song. He still thought he could compete at the highest level and contribute to the best teams and still win league titles, still win you know um, league cups, uh, domestic cups, and Champions League, quite you know challenging and stuff. I think he still believes he can still contribute to a team on that level. And I think from what he's proved with United, scoring 18 goals in the season, despite playing for a very dysfunctional team, he's clearly proved if you just want goals and you don't care about the all all around general play and all that stuff, then Ronaldo is still a pretty potent figurehead to have up front and a pretty useful player to have in your squad. But unfortunately, it's Cristiano Ronaldo. Do you know what I mean? With the name that he carries and the gravitas and the uh, kind of, you know, this sort of reputation that he has, it's very hard to have a player like Cristiano Ronaldo just be a squad player. He's, he's going he's gonna to ruffle some feathers. He's not going to be happy with being on a bench. And it just isn't the kind of influence or environment that you need in a club, especially a club like United that's already suffering from dysfunction, is really suffering from players who are already kind of entitled and have big egos anyway. There's a lot of division in the camp for lack of accountability, lack of, you know, repercussions or responsibility taken on players, blah, 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 blah. The last thing you need is a manager to have Ronaldo there. So I was surprised when there was no immediate news that came out as soon as the season finished that he was going to leave. But then when that news didn't come out and then it came out that Ten Hag sat down with Ronaldo and he had a conversation and he basically assured, you got the feeling from the quotes that we heard or from the leaks that came out that one of, that somebody on Christian Ronaldo's side basically gave Ten Hag reassurances that he could count on him. Then Ten Hag comes out and says, you know, I'm, I can count on him. I'm looking forward to having him on a tour and integrating him into the squad, blah, blah, blah. And then fast forward a couple of days later, we hear some news that um, Cristiano Ronaldo's wife, who has this amazing actual Netflix documentary, you should definitely check out. I didn't really think I'd like it, but it's actually a pretty good watch. So definitely go and check it out. I forgot her name. It's actually just her name. It's the title of it. But it then gets announced that 
something happened with the family. No, it's against announced that she is not happy at, at Manchester, basically. And the narrative that's coming out from the camp of Ronaldo is that I think prior to the end of the season, unfortunately for Ronaldo and his family, or Ronaldo and his wife, um, the they're twins, right? And one of the twins passed away prematurely. And um, supposedly the, the story coming out from Ronaldo's camp was that the Cristiano's wife is not happy with going back to Manchester because it reminds her of all those dark times, right? Which is understandable. So they went back to Portugal, where they live, etc., to kind of you know kind of unwind and detach from the life in Manchester and stuff because it brings back too many bad memories. Understandable. Then later on, we hear some stories about there's another family emergency that basically prevents Ronaldo from joining up with the guys on tour, which basically meant he missed the entire preseason tour that we did, you know, um, in Australia and whatnot. And now we're in a scenario where ever since then, there's been story after story after story about Ronaldo being linked to every single club in Europe and every club in Europe essentially refusing to sign him or basically saying we can't afford to sign him or the wages are too much. I even saw his name being linked with like Olympic Marseille and stuff like crazy shit. And recently I saw his name being linked with Atletico Madrid and Atletico Madrid like supporters or maybe ultras came out and basically said we don't want him anywhere near our club. Of course, for the damage he's inflicted on their club since when he was at Real Madrid and also when he was at Juventus. I remember that kind of iconic celebration where he kind of, you know, looked like he was telling them he was, you know, he was basically uh, performing for Lacio on a effort to come into his fans' faces and shit. But in general, it seems like his agent or his team has not been shy to basically float his name around with different clubs. And now we don't really know where he stands. But the thing that I like at the moment is that it feels like Ten Hag is at a point where he's not going to let any player dictate in the situation. And according to this report, courtesy of the Daily Mail, he's actually going to sit down with Cristiano and have some clear air talks in order to kind of ascertain where he's at mentally. And since he had a title, Christian Ronaldo has travelled back to Manchester ahead of the showdown talks with Eric Ten Hag over his future set to take place today, with Man United insisting the veteran superstar won't be sold despite him wanting out of Old Trafford. Christian Ronaldo is set to try with Man United, manager Ten Hag. Ronaldo was expected to be back in Manchester on Monday night and could meet Ten Hag's earliest Tuesday and um, ahead of the rest of the squad returned to training from the club's tour in Thailand and Australia. The 37-year-old Portugal star has missed the three weeks of pre-season after being given compassionate leave for his family issue, having told United he wants to leave United this summer. Um, Ten Hag, Ten Hag then talked. Ten Hag talked to Ronaldo when he took over at the end of the season, but it will be the first time the two have spoken since the playoffs to go. So that's the only issue I have. I don't have an issue with him deciding he wants to leave. That's okay. You can go if you want to. No problem with that whatsoever. I just have the problem with like he obviously told Ten Hag one thing at the end of the season, and then when he kind of had time to kind of maybe um, you know marinate on his decision or think about his future of his family he suddenly changed now i'm not like personally for me i think it's it's really funny with the, from the clubs from the fan base's point of view and i think it basically shows that if you don't if you don't if you're well liked basically you get away with murder because you look at the reaction that pogba got with united fans when he basically said he went to leave and you know go and try and win win things with other clubs and stuff the reaction to him was very negative compared to what Ronaldo's done. And I'm pretty sure when Ronaldo comes back and plays his first game for United, because I don't I don't see him going because, you know, un unfortunately the wages just aren't, uh, aren't basically applicable to a lot of clubs out there. It won't be surprised if you hear the whole entire Old Trafford Stadium singing Viva Ronaldo. It's definitely going to happen, which is really shameful because it shows up just how kind of small time our fans are in some respects because I guess Ronaldo represents the last sort of like hurrah of our club he represents the last time we were truly successful and truly dominant especially in the in the Premier League especially in England and we were competing actually in the Champions League at that point too that was the last time we would we were that kind of force so people kind of look at Ronaldo and automatically think oh if we see Ronaldo that means good times are coming back but he's not the player he once was he's got the he's got the stats to kind of back it up but in terms of in play he's not the player that we once had Dodd, not for me anyway. The Ronaldo I I love was the 07 08 Ronaldo. Do you know what I mean on the wings, cutting in, just being an absolute menace? But this Ronaldo version of Ronaldo is not really the one for me up front, personally. But it'd be interesting to see what the reception will be when he does end up coming back, which I think will be, you know, rapturous applause in my opinion. It continues here. Contact between the two camps has been maintained by United Chief Executive Richard Arnold and Ronaldo's agent Jorge Mendes, who's been hawking his client around to Europe's top clubs. Ronaldo's return is being seen as a positive sign, although it's unclear whether he's ready to commit to United for another season or reiterate to his desire to be sold. United was still adamant on Monday night that Ronaldo is not for sale and remains part of Ten Hag's plans for a new season. The five-time Ballon d'Or winner has been keeping himself fit in Lisbon, but he may be not ready to go straight back into full training with the rest of the squad who had Monday off after flying back from Perth on Sunday. 
I wonder if how Harry Maguire feels. Harry Maguire's probably conflicted. He probably wants him to leave because now Ronaldo's out of the, the dressing room. He can basically, basically reassert his authority as a captain because, you know, last season there was clearly a bit of a divide in the camp between the people that were with Ronaldo and with Harry Maguire. And obviously with him being under new manager now and being given a new lease of life and Eric Ten Hag basically saying he can shut up the boot boys if he just performs well, there's clearly an onus on Harry Maguire to basically use this campaign, this new season as a chance to kind of um, rewrite some wrongs of the past seasons and stuff. So he's probably thinking, I wouldn't mind you going, you know, you should probably leave. If you leave, I've probably got time to do my own thing, have some space, do you know what I mean? Assert my authority and remind people like why people used to rate me back in the day. But the moment Ronaldo walks back into the change room again, it's going to be like, oh shit. It's like, it's like you thinking the bully, that he's a bully every day in school, move schools, but then actually he didn't. It was just all a lie and he comes back in on Monday like, fuck. Um, yeah, and there was a picture of his family. Obviously, you can tell he's very family orientated. So if this story about his wife is the one who's basically pushing for the move away from Manchester because Manchester brings back too many bad memories because of the loss of their of their child, he would definitely leave. I, I think Ronaldo's that kind of player who, or that kind of person anyway, who is not money motivated, I don't think. Although he does get paid a crazy salary in terms of, you know, everyday work or whatnot, I still think he's somebody who's mostly driven by personal glory. Do you know what I mean? By winning titles, winning trophies and all that kind of stuff. I don't think he's in it only for the money at this point because he makes millions, millions just off his Instagram alone. So if his wife says, hey, I'm over Manchester, fuck that place. The weather sucks. The food's horrible. The people are dour. <laughs> and, uh, I've got bad memories from my family there. Let's leave. I reckon he'll definitely go 100%. Dutch manager Eric Ten Hag has remained pos consistently tight-lipped when facing questions of the club's fu club legend's future and has suggested Ronaldo will remain a United player at least another season. The five-time Baron Dolan has 12 months remaining on his on his deal and last season's arrival from Juventus but there's an option for a further year. Ten Hag said when questioned in Australia, I'm well informed he also has an option for another year. Yes, he could stay beyond this season but to be honest, of course, I've signed here for three years but in football it's short term as well. We have to win for the start so I don't look that that far ahead i have a strategy it's a process to take time but in the end we have to make sure uh, that from the outset this is the winning team so let's see what happens but it's i'm pretty sure that he's probably going to end up leaving that's my gut feeling and i think overall i wouldn't be too against it to be honest i think the team does need a bit of a fresh start it would be nice to kind of get that kind of old regime or that kind of old way of looking at things in terms of signing marquee players and you know and thinking they're going to solve things and be the saviors out of our club and make it more of a collective issue of course we'll be one less striker down so put a lot of pressure on the current front three who have been playing on tour which has been um martial rashford and sancho but you know this is what being at a big club is like do you know what i mean so if that's that's a, if that happens then i won't be too bad i won't be too um, upset about it to be honest i have to be completely honest to be over but i would be i would also like to see if ronaldo could actually integrate himself into a ten Hag team with the pressing and stuff and how he'd actually work in that team because i think ten Hag did seem pretty excited about getting a hold of ronaldo as a coach i mean i'd imagine having the ability to coach one of the best players in the world despite his age and seeing if you can implement some of your strategies and your techniques and your tactics and whatnot formations and adapt him into that would probably be exciting but you know it is what it is um we move on so over the weekend i went to see um freddie k and dvs1 player e1 the lady machine was also playing but i missed out on seeing her my main my main priorities were seeing freddie k and um the lady sorry freddie k and dvs1 dvs1 i've always had a big a lot of time for because number one he talks really well about dance music about club culture about electronic music in, in general about techno about berlin about the scene about festivals he seems to have very um egalitarian almost utopian views on what the future of dance music could be like and I do like that from him. He, see, he seems very eloquent and um, very well put together dude. <clears throat> but he's also a beast behind the decks, right? He has a very almost, I like to describe it, mechanical way of mixing. It's like, it's like obviously, I think most of the time he's playing with three decks, so I maybe kind of helps. But when he's mixing, it's not just him fading out one part that's kind of, you know, on the breakdown and then feeding in the other part. No, he's actually crafting a new sort of soundscape with the tunes that he's basically using at that time. It's really, really impressive to see him in real time. So I just wanted to go see him play, see what the vibe is like and kind of catch it all. I wasn't really aiming to go, to be honest, because um, I was pretty tired that weekend. I had had gym, did a bunch of other stuff, so I was, wasn't really in the mood. But ever since I bought my fixie, 
it's been a bit easier to kind of pop out to these kind of events and just kind of ride down. The ride there was like, what, half an hour or so from where I lived to kind of go to E1, which is basically in central east, you'd call it Wapping-ish kind of area. Um, so that was pretty easy to kind of go down there and head there. Um, luckily, they had a couple of poles just outside the clubs, which is nice too, um, that can kind of rack my bike up at so I could easily pop out in the smoking area and double check it and make sure it's there. But for the most part, you're not really going to get a lot of people, you know, trying to pickpocket or break a lock for a bike. Those are kind of early hours in the morning, it's unlikely. Uh, maybe if you leave it, you know, the rest of the day, but usually at around, you know, 2 a.m. whenever I was there, that's unlikely to happen. So that was pretty easy to do. The entry process was pretty easy as well. The only thing I don't like about E1 is that they've got an incredible long barricade around the club. So when you basically walk down the street, you have to kind of walk back around it again to go to the front to kind of go through the barricades. And then you go, you give them your ID to take a picture, you get searched, you dump your contents into a into a fucking tub they search you like you're going through an airport and then you go through you get you scan your ticket you get stamped it's just like a fucking it's just a thing you have to get used to in london you have to kind of just zone out but it does kind of kick you out of the of the mood of raving because you immediately feel like you've been accosted especially if you've got some stuff on you do you know what i mean you feel like oh shit you get completely nervous you start climbing up and stuff starts getting worried and start oh start worrying about your people come if they say to me i'm not gonna leave da, 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 da. so it kind of takes you out of the mood of kind of just raving and having a good time which is a shame but hey this is what we have here in london then you go through there's a cloak area cloakroom area that you could use it's pretty handy because they take card because most cloakroom areas i've been to especially in other clubs that usually don't take card it's usually always cash so then you end up having to hold your shit if you don't have any cash use so that was nice then i go in and oh my god e1 might have been one of the most sweatiest and nastiest humidest clubs i've ever been to in my whole life during the summer months it's absolutely rank in there man the level of air conditioning is pitiful, pitiful to say the least, especially considering the amount, like, again, I don't know, operational cost for that kind of place must be high, don't get me wrong, but still, the amount of money they must make on a nightly basis, they should be able to afford decent fucking air conditioning, please, for the love of God, and there's a real shame too, because he won over the last few over the, the last 18 months or so i don't know who's in charge of the programming or who does the booking or whatever it may be but they've really stepped it up lately because before it used to be full of only like tech housey type nights and really corny cheesy commercial stuff but nowadays they're really doing a good job of mixing like a random night a random kind of boudicca night which is mostly like lgbtq queer type friendly type party and then they've got some really standard tech housey nights and then they've got some really standard berlin-y type lineups that you would be used to seeing in maybe continental europe that with the lady machine freddie k and dvs1 playing so they've got a real good mix of kind of people playing there on like a weekly basis so it's a real shame that they don't have the air conditioning to allow you to really rave and let your hair down the air conditioning was non-existent there were parts and pockets on the main dance floor which is i think we were in the warehouse bit which has the ward speakers right that looks amazing to kind of see but obviously it's going to kill your ears but there were pockets of kind of good space where you can kind of you know get some air in you but when i went to the front because I, st I stood near the front to see um to see freddie k for a bit i think i've got a video of it here actually where is it um there we go yeah, i've got a video of it here i'm gonna quickly play for you if you're watching this via the if you listen to this on youtube you'll just hear it quickly let me put it back so so this is freddie k at dvs1 right and i'm right near the front towards like one of the left pillars and it's absolutely streaming down with fucking sweat it's literally the walls are actually dripping Yeah, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. Um, but the DJs are so good, it kind of made it worth it. Like Freddie K was an absolute fire. He was tearing that place apart. To see him playing vinyl in that space, knowing how warm it was, knowing how vinyl warps in the heat and stuff and people shaking the stage and the barricades and stuff. And he was able to still mix flawlessly with vinyl like absolute maximum respect and props to that guy man one absolute masterclass that was to see in real time really was phenomenal and i did my best to kind of see it from all places i went to the front of the stage to kind of listen to him i went to the right of the stage to listen to him i went to the back to listen to him and it was absolutely jumping from front to back and then 
Of course, the piece de resistance was flipping DVS1. I've got a clip of him playing to them. Let's click that to start. Yeah, honestly, apart from the sweat and apart from the maybe overzealous security guards, who, to be honest, let me just take that back a little bit. As much as I think previous times I've been to E1, the security has been a lot more heavy handed. I feel like this time around, even though there was a, there was a lot of them in there, you still have to get used to seeing a lot more, you know, security jackets around on the dance floor than you would in kind of other parts of Europe. They weren't that heavy handed. They were basically observing for the most part. And I did see a few people being naughty on the dance floor and having bumps and not going to the toilet and being sensible, but, you know, doing that kind of teenage It's a bit embarrassing. If you're over the age of like 19 and you're taking bumps on the dance floor, you need to have a look at yourself. Do you know what I mean? Go to the toilet like everyone else does and kind of have some respect for yourself and the people around you but hey people are going to do what they're going to do so i did i, I did see a lot more people doing the dance floor which is usually a sign that the dance floor is a lot more free and less sort of like patrolled and surveyed as it might have been in the past so that was nice but god damn it the drinks prices wow in e1 a beer and a shot of jägermeister was like 14 pounds i was like god damn that's fucking tough but you know it is what it is for the drink prices but overall in terms of the sound in terms of the lineup people that played was superb i just wished e1 would just go a step further and just get some decent air con man like honestly like you can't in this sort of weather be subjecting people to this sort of heat and again the problem with the e1 in general is always warm even in the winter months it gets really sweaty in there really quickly which people kind of like because i guess you get to take your top off and if you're one of those kind of um really ripped gay dudes who likes to take their top off and dance around places and whatnot and it's probably nice but in general i'm not a fan of it i'm really really not a fan of it i would much prefer it when it's just cool and you can actually have a good time hang around and not have to pop out to the smoking area every 10 minutes like i was doing i was going out there every like 10 20 minutes to kind of get my get my, catch some catch my breath and kind of go back in there but every time i went back out there i could just feel how wet my t-shirt is like it was heavy that was how wet it was it was fucking heavy and i obviously like to dance i don't you know i'm not someone that's going to be posted up against the wall just kind of you know mean mugging people i actually want to have a good time so i was going for it my t-shirt was covered in fucking sweat man and this is the last kind of video that i'll play for you that i took there actually new one And this kind of shows the kind of the scale of the party and how many people are actually in there. It wasn't super, super full, but maybe some one of the fullest stuff's kind of seen E1 in a while because it's a really big space. I think that main, if I was if I was going to, if I was going to guess, I'd say that main warehouse space in E1 is maybe a thousand capacity. Let's see if I can Google this. Um, E1 warehouse capacity. Let's see if I can get this out there. I think it's about a thousand people, so it's pretty big. You know what I mean? To have to have it completely full is a bit a bit of a mad one. Let's see if I can find it. E1 capacity warehouse. Okay, people are saying um it's seven hundred to one thousand six hundred standing. Okay, seven hundred ones, okay. So it's a little bit bigger than than fold and as a space and it was pretty decently packed, I think. <laughs> So the and again the the best time for me nowadays, especially with my fixie bike, the best time for me nowadays is going home from the club. I legitimately enjoy it because I literally just get to jump on my bike and just cycle back, you know, sober up in a cool breeze. Maybe 
like uh, grab a quick little McDonald's break and just go home and sleep or shower and sleep. It's so fucking good, man. Honestly, it's the best thing ever. I can't believe I didn't do it sooner. Obviously, when there's other parties where I really want to get mash up and stuff, I don't take my bike with me because I don't want to get into an accident. But for the most part, this kind of party, I had like one drink. You know, I didn't do anything else. I just kind of hanged out for a little bit. And basically that drink didn't do anything because it was just basically hydrating me. It didn't, drink, it didn't make me drunk at all. I just basically sweated it out in basically 10 minutes. But it was a real good time. I really did enjoy it. But again, I just wish they would have actual hair conditioning in there because God almighty, man, it was so fucking hot, so sticky, so nasty. The beer was just on a crazy level. Every time I kept smelling some people and I think someone was stinky, I would kept thinking it was me. But then someone walked past, I was like, oh shit, that definitely isn't me, mate. That's like other people. And there were some big burly guys in there. Do you know what I mean, people who sweat for real so that was a real funky place to be in man like pick up everybody that saw in there snogging each other and shit i don't know how you guys do it in that kind of heat with all that stickiness around you but again love is love in it love is love so big up everyone there big up everyone there next on the list here we have some pretty disappointing news i should have reported on a few weeks ago but you know i kind of missed it so please forgive me but if regarding print works one of the premier nightclubs we have here in london is unfortunately closing down due to the local council deciding that they want to prioritize you know fucking flats and buildings made out of glass and steel again uh, instead of a cultural community space like a nightclub that basically you know brings loads of people from surrounding areas or all over the world to that area of london to celebrate under that roof the culture of dance music and to kind of give something back to local community as well by going to local shops and all that good stuff right they want to replace that all with flipping shiny buildings and it's just annoying it really is gentrification sucks so badly and it's a shame too because i feel like over the last few years we've suddenly we suddenly started to get a bit of head of steam in terms of actual clubs um, building a little cl culture or community around them and then out of nowhere quite a few of them have kind of closed back to back and enough some of them are not going to reopen or some of them are struggling to find a new space in terms of the cause and whatnot and it's just annoying to see this it really really is because we don't we seem to do one step forward and then three or four steps backwards when it comes to club culture in the uk nothing ever ever lasts forever and even the and the thing that's weird about the print works is like it's one thing if it was like an underground club in Dawson, an underground club in Tottenham, an underground club in Peckham, New Cross, I don't know, Stanmore, whatever you may be called. This is like a pretty commercial club in terms of its lineup, right? They pick some pretty big hitters in terms of people who want to play there on a weekly basis. Um, the most generic kind of dance music you could kind of basically know will basically be played at, you know, print works. And they have, you know, they, they basically hire the place out for movies and stuff. Obviously, you've seen it featured in the Batman, but they have different adverts to get filmed in there. Loads of conferences and panel discussions and sometimes art exhibitions. It's a space that's been really, they, they, they've squeezed as much as they can of it in terms of commercially, right? And still, they couldn't fend off the powers that be in terms of local council. So if, so you have to wonder, if you're a, if you're a kind of future perspective um, club owner who kind of has some plans you know you write down on the back of a beer mat when you're with your friends out somewhere and you're thinking yeah man I could do this thing I could open a club and really set the mood and kind of bring something new and exciting to London you have to kind of scratch your head and maybe think twice because if print works couldn't make it happen what gives you the right to think that you can make it happen you know what I mean they had all the commercial um all the commercial success behind them and still they couldn't fend off the powers that be it's absolutely crazy but anyway Kurt Shivari News it says as follows Suffolk Council has officially approved the plan meaning the club will shut for good Printworks is officially set to close following a decision by the Suffolk Council to go ahead and redevelopment last October the owner of the property British Land submitted a proposal to redevelop the land and turn the current location of the club into office space fucking hell so, it was all, so, so basically either it was always a temporary space anyway or there was a thinking it was going to stay permanent, but then for some reason it decided to just change their mind and build some fucking, build, build some flats and whatnot. I guess if you're a cold-hearted business person, just looking at the money, considering we had a pandemic, it's probably beneficial to be like, what's going to be more permanent, a nightclub or some, some kind of, some housing? And most probably the, the housing will probably be there far more on a far more permanent basis than a club will because obviously clubs were the first things to close when the pandemic started and the last to open so if you're a hard-nosed business person then maybe it, it does make sense to be like you know what let's just go for the fucking commercial buildings because people are always going to need to work people are always going to need to live but they're not you know what i mean no one kind of um 
in this society anyway they think like clubbing is basically a luxury it's not something that people actually need which they actually do because a lot of people suffer from mental health issues during that whole peak of the pandemic where we had nowhere to go do you know what i mean um, i know i did anyway it continues despite a 10,000 strong petition they never work the wider industry adv advocacy this week Suffolk Council approved the plan meaning the club will close for good according to Suffolk News in the recommendation the councillors noted the success of the 6,000 capacity venue which opened in 27 but also said that the use of the former Ludwig Prince facility was, was always temporary with the plan to redevelop the long in the work so as per usual what they always do they it, gentrification feels a little bit like um, culture vulture sort of stuff right they basically come in and they use the resources of the local community to garner a bit of cool points to kind of appeal to get people kind of talking about that space again or that area then as soon as that area starts to pop off again because there are some people out there i wouldn't do it myself but some people out there who basically decide on where they're going to live based on the clubs that are there based on the local shops based on transport connections those kind of all play into the decision making of where they're going to buy a new flat or where they're going to rent or sometimes even set up a business so that whole place must be popping now right off the back of print works in some respects right even though south and that kind of council is always kind of you know on the up and up when it comes to the arts but i'm sure print works added to it so they use it for all the juice and the clout kind of tokens that they can. And in the moment they don't need it anymore, they dash it to the side and then bring in all the flipping uppity, wuppities, nobbets to come in and rent these fucking absurd flats that no one's going to live in that are just going to blend into all the other flats all over the place that look exactly the same. Loads of glass, loads of steel, no innovation, no ingenuity behind it. Nothing that's going to appeal to, you know, the local community. Nothing that's going to serve the local community. Nothing that's going to serve people who are basically underrepresented or people that don't really have any homes in that kind of area or people who are still on the temporary housing list in terms of local council. None of people are going to be serviced. It's all going to be foreign investors coming in and basically buying all those places up and then renting them for exorbitant prices to us people like myself do you know i mean like what they call it um young professionals and whatnot it's absolutely heinous it really is heinous the replacement of print works will consist of a free part building ranging to five to seven stories featuring a six mix of offices and retail Ooh, we've never seen that before have we we've never seen that before as part of the larger canada water redevelopment master plan last year britain's bland also told survey that it was a talks with print works operator broadwork live saying that it recognizes them as a key collaborator and tenant following their success of Primos over the last five years and that culture will play an important part for the new episode to fuck off well so what are they going to do they're going to build like a little kiosk remembering print works a little kind of information point at one point this place used to be a nightclub now it's not you know what I mean like go and fuck yourself man and it's annoying because I remember when when Fold first opened up and I remember I think I talked about it in my first review when Fold first opened as much as I was incredibly excited about Fold because I legitimately am from Canning Town Custom House right I'm from that area I went to schools in that area and I'm, I now used to remember living in my mum's house and having to basically jump on the number 5 bus or get the 25 and go, get, go into Central or go into Central East or go into kind of Trendy East and Dawson and Hackney to go and rave I remember having to do those kind of missions all the time so to suddenly see a next club playing techno music around the corner from where i used to live around the corner from where i used to do my runs and stuff was fucking blowing my mind so i was that hyped about it but the other thing that made me so hyped about fold was i was thinking you know what this could be because it was going to be the first kind of 24-hour club which didn't really transpire they kind of have they kind of have some 24-hour nights but it's not always a 24-hour club it's just a you know a club that opens until six but it's still one of the only ones that does that i was under the thinking that this could be a good sort of a proving ground to show that it's needed because Cane Town is still a bit of a far flung place. It's not it's not trendy East London, right? It's not Shoreditch, it's not Hackney. Um, it's not all these kind of cool places it's still a bit out of the way to kind of get to even though it's kind of it's kind of coming up a bit now and there's people trendy hipster type people moving in it still is a bit of a place mission to go to so i thought if this could work this could maybe show other councils that if they have buildings such as where fold is which is essentially in the middle of an industrial park because i remember i used to go next to where fold is they, they used to be a dhl collection point and when i used to order shoes or resell shoes or buy resale shoes from back in the day i used to always pick up my um my parcels from that collection point because the delivery drivers wouldn't ever deliver to my house because my house was blacklisted because of all the fucking robberies and because i grew up in a bit of a rough area so I thought to myself, if other local councils could see that those industrial areas where there's basically nothing happening there, there's lots of empty spaces or whatnot, just lend those spaces to clubs and let them kind of redevelop them and bring new life to that area, 
bring some money to the local community or the local you know economy because you'll get people buying from the local off licenses or going to the local mcdonald's or going to the to fast food place or whatever maybe just hang or maybe even get in apartments and homes there because it won't be necessarily a club that would be like a good thing and we could have essentially a fold in north a fold in west a fold in south because in each part of london we have those kind of industrial parks they exist right they're a bit outside of the area but they always exist where you basically have um factories you have offices you have you know business addresses and stuff where you have you know postal collection points or you have bus garages they exist everywhere and those places are usually far away from residential areas too so you can essentially not worry that much about noise pollution so i thought that was what would happen and then it didn't obviously transpire because you know one of the biggest clubs in london in print works is now having to close because the local council is saying they prefer flats over clubs that are actually providing something you know beneficial you know and substantial to local community and stuff it's just really really sad and really disappointed to be honest but again i shouldn't be surprised but it's just a shame yeah i mean nothing can really grow there's no real there's no real kind of onus to kind of build out the club culture here in london it's just whatever happens whatever comes around you go to it that's why it's important actually to go back to that sometimes it's important whatever space is around whatever club that you do like support them as much as possible when they're open and when they're around go to them attend them go to as many nights as you can over there spend some money tip the bartenders whatever it may be because you never know when these clubs are going to close you never honestly you know nothing ever lasts forever in the uk not forever but it never lasts for like a long time there's no institutions here do you know what i mean apart from what ministry of sound or something everything else always kind of falls by the wayside it's super super annoying it really is man it kind of drives me crazy but i guess it's a standard kind of court standard um um cause and effect of living in london talking about cause and effect it appears that london promoter the cause has um got their hands on a new space that they're going to do a free month program in which is pretty cool to see because i remember when i was last in fabric well when was i last in fabric that must have been that might have been for a ricardo villa lobos night ages ago and i was in a green room luckily enough i happened to get a wristband to go in the green room and i happened to bump into or speak to one of the guys involved in the cause very brief conversation and he said something along the lines of oh yeah we've secured a new space right we just saw it out now but it's a lot of stress but we secured a new space now it's time ago nothing really transpired after that. i'm not too sure if that's the same space that they're using now or if that's another space they've got coming up but he did seem kind of sure that they were going to open up fairly soon so i'm not too sure what the deal is but it's cool to see regardless anyway that they have got a space sorted because again like i've mentioned previously for a long time there was a real dearth in kind of variety in club nights here in the uk they were all kind of the same but i felt like with the places like the cores with a place like the um the color factory which was formerly the mixed garage in hackney wick with the spaces like the fold fold of course um with corsica and south every sort of place has its kind of different sensibilities and programming even pickle factory and whatnot and oval space they all have a different sort of idea on what they think clubbing clubbing should look like and who should play different nice bloody blah 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 but i felt like the course had a very distinctive and very definitive london uk-esque tilt and perspective on club nights a lot of jungle a lot of grime a lot of bass music um a lot of dubstep just a lot of kind of uk specific sort of views on it or maybe just a uk um interpretation of house music and techno music i mean that's what i really liked about it to be honest so i'm really i'm a big fan of what they do and how they kind of operate and go about things so this is courtesy of um RA said London promoter the cause reveals free month program at new industrial venue the first shows um is the cause's fourth birthday this Saturday July 23rd which I just missed London promoter in London former club the cause is taking over TBA venue the series Doug possibly maybe will launch this Saturday July 23rd and will run at least until September 24th the venue is a brutalist East London indoor and outdoor industrial space according to the press release while this site has tons of potential its, it's charm is also its downfall said Eugene Wilde the co-founder just like the cause it's, uh, it could be a around six months for a few years <laughs> this summer so they love to have i wonder if they just enjoyed this anyway because it's part of the process because it feels a bit sports direct in it it feels a bit like sports direct like they're always closing down like you know last 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 sale coming up going to liquidation it's always around like do you know what i mean sports direct was around for ages before it's still around now isn't it what i'm talking about yeah, jeremy there's always closing down always closing down so it never actually closed down so i wonder if the course actually do enjoy hanging around these kind of temporary semi-temporary spaces because it always kind of drives punters to, to be like oh this is the last party let me go it's the last event let me go 
I mean, but I don't anyway. Just at the cause, it could be around six months or a few years. This summer certainly won't be the full beast as the cause was when we closed. So for now, we're dipping our toes in this side project to test the site while we work out what could be, uh, what could not, we work out what could or could not become. And while keeping our options open for other spaces. The first part of the cause for birthday this weekend is lineup remain unannounced. Other highlights include um, Brick Post and Keep Hush on August the 13th, Alien Communications, and Adonis will also host free events including the fifth birthday party on September the 3rd that should be really good we have more shows to follow earlier this year the course let us home in Tottenham London after nearly four years since then the team has hosted off parties on one of parties in the first festival the course Seaside the possible main program is as follows so yeah let me check out actually I, I saw him on Instagram let me see if I can see what it actually looked like on Instagram the parties because I think the parties looked fairly decent from what I could see and plus Instagram has this feature back again that I fucking love um, where you can basically set to go to the location of the place and it can show you the latest um, stories that people are uploading so you get to see it in real time and I used to use it all the time especially when I was going out a lot I'd want to check out if a club was full or if the queue was too long you just click the location of it on your search bar on Instagram stories and it would kind of show up all the kind of things that are happening in that local area at that certain time so let's see what people are showing what they've loaded anyway themselves um, on their account here the cause Instagram account the cause London let me see what they actually uploaded on there from the last parties or so yeah, it looks cool, innit? It looks like a cool little space, to be honest. Open air on the outside during the heat. That must have been lovely. I would much prefer that over going to E1 and being in a sweat box. That looks pretty cool. <laughs> and then the inside. And then have a bit of the inside, someone putting the middle finger up there. Some girl called Ima G, Ima IG smashing it. That's one thing I do like about the cause. They do have, it's always very, it's always very like, it's always kind of very raw how they kind of put their clubs together. I mean, it's just the space, isn't it? But there's always a very tactile, almost kind of, you know, straight in your face approach to DJing. No, they just never kind of up above some, even the cage they had, it was always a cage, but it's, you could basically, you know, put your finger and kind of stick your finger in the DJ's eye if you wanted to. It's always kind of up in your face. They do a really good job of making it feel sort of, you're all part of one thing together at the same time. It's really, really interesting how they do that, which is, of course, a standard kind of trope for most kind of warehouse spaces here in the UK and London, especially old school clubs. But I do like how they kind of maintain that going forward. So that's pretty cool to see. Let's see if I can see any more kind of videos from over the weekend. I doubt it because why would I see that? Yeah, they didn't actually tag the location in it because they don't have a location at the moment. So it'd be a bit hard to tag it, wouldn't it? But yeah, it looks like they're kind of coming back slowly but surely. So we hope you should see something from them happening in the next few weeks or so regarding the um, regarding the reopening of this new club that they tend, they're going to be hopefully opening up very soon. I'd love to see because like I said, we definitely do need um, some refresh in terms of uh, the clubbing landscape. And I think especially with Cause, they do do a fairly good job in terms of their programming and actually having some fun people playing and actually having different type of sounds based on, you know, different types of genres and stuff, more so than the basic stuff you hear in most clubs here in London and stuff. So hopefully they get that sorted rather soon. Did this thing got to load up so I can see the location or not? There we go. Yep, it's loading up now. Let's see if I can see this on the, on the Instagram, on the account, because you can see on the phone now, the feature's back again. Because it, was, it wasn't up for a while, so hopefully you can see it again. Can you see it? Oof, it doesn't really work too tough on here, but it is available on the phone again anyway. You can see the locations and kind of click on them and see what people are doing. Blah, de, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the cause is back. The cause is back in some way, shape, or form. What else I've got here? Let's talk about... Um, do, 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 do. Quickly, quickly, Lotus up. Let's see what else the next story here I got to talk about. Let's move on from that one. Yes, it's interesting. Yes, it's pretty interesting. Yes, again, courtesy of dance music scene, scene stuff. So it's courtesy of RA. <clears throat> Pretty news concerning a new Bergheim resident has been announced, courtesy of RA, by the name of Fadi Mohem. 
I haven't actually seen this gentleman play at Berghain yet, as you guys mostly know. I am a bit of a Berghain slut, and I go there basically twice a year, even though I'm nowhere from there, and I'm over here in the UK. I tend to make a bit of a you know, yearly pilgrimage over there to try and listen to some of the best DJs in the world, in one of the best clubs in the world that plays anything concerning dance music i mean it's not just techno it's house it's all that's good stuff they play in panorama bar in the in the in the room downstairs the triple x room and shit i mean they have a really a very wide broad range of genres they play in the burghain nowadays it doesn't always kind of you know really rest on the techno thing it kind of depends on what kind of night you're really up to but it seems like ever since they reopened <clears throat> post pandemic maybe because of just circumstances and because the world has changed they basically it looks like we're prioritizing a lot of their kind of friends and family i wouldn't say only people that are based in berlin but it seemed that they were really pushing to have a lot of people who are basically part of the local community a lot of people that are part of the extended regulars kind of um universe that basically populates the majority of that club which is quite nice right a lot of the people that you see queue up in that guest list queue some of them are obviously friends of djs or friends of people who work at Bergheim. a lot of those people are basically regular regulars who basically get the opportunity to put their name on the guest list so they can kind of have an advantage to kind of get in early or they get in a regular queue and the bouncers recognize them and they always kind of let them in also so that's pretty nice to see going forward um but there has been i feel like more owners put in a lot of the resident djs and more owners put in just promoting the local friends and family and i feel like this year bar none has seen probably more announcements concerning Bergheim residents than i've ever seen in my life maybe because beforehand it wasn't as a popular of a space and people maybe because the whole social media night clubbing or clubbing scene is not as big as it was prior but i never think i've heard i don't think i've heard as many announcements from burkhan concerning residents and i beforehand because i remember i forgot who the lady was before um who was it there was two ladies that got that got residencies beforehand and then now there's this guy called uh fadi moham the ladies before i think it was lakuti before fadi moham and it was another lady too i forgot her name um who was who's got the residency recently so it's pretty nice to see them pushing this and i think also for guys like myself guys and girls like myself who are kind of up and coming djs who will eventually love to get the opportunity to play in Bergheim once or have the opportunity to become a resident maybe sometime in the future it's nice to see that they are giving kind of newer people in the scene an opportunity to become resident even though someone like Lakuti is somebody that's been fairly established in the scene I still feel like she kind of started quite late in life and is kind of new in general maybe not to the kind of the people that are in the know that know what's up but she's still a fairly new kind of quote-unquote face and I feel like all three of the ones that have been promoted to residents so far in Berkheim are fairly new faces so it kind of gives the people coming up like myself encouragement that you could also make it and I, and I guess if you're even it, forget me because i'm in london and i'm all the way over here but i guess even if you're from there and you're familiar with these people you've raved with them before you've seen them out and about you bumped into them at record stores it's pretty nice and reassuring to be like oh cool it's not as far away as i think it is because i think i mentioned it plenty of times on here but i've mentioned basically said i think me trying to pursue this djing thing is mostly because it's one of the best hobbies in the world and it'll be nice it'll be amazing and it'll be so kind of it'll be the biggest privilege in the world to be able to turn it into a professional gig but it's also because i just love clubs i love to be able to play in some of the best clubs in the world that i've kind of visited over the years such as robert johnson and the like that'd be great to kind of see them and i would have liked to have played in a place like the school but obviously it closed down that was a real shame so that's kind of part of it right to have that kind of ability to be able to play let's say um what does dixon do dixon says you know, he does like 100 gigs a, a year right let's say if i if i said i wanted to like because dj and i don't want it to be my entire life i want to do other things also but let's say i had the ability to play like 50 really key dates a year which would include like all the popular part all the popular festivals all the popular promotions in terms of different promoters around europe um all in the best clubs 50 dates a year all over across the place that'd be fucking amazing to go and see in it but i think i mentioned a few times on here that legitimately DJing is one of the most hardest professions to ever break it, to break in nowadays, especially in the creative or in the arts, whatever you maybe call it. Because I mentioned I was speaking to someone about it the other day. It's the only art form, I think, especially in music, or it's the only, you know, art, yeah, it's the only genre, in art, or whatever you call it, right? It's the only area in music that doesn't require you to have like a distinct talent in kind of making the music or singing or whatnot, right? The bar of entry is really low because you could just buy a DJ controller from any store for as little as 20 bucks or maybe second hand even less than that and you can basically hook it up to some pretty easy to download um music management software online and essentially get to mixing 
right using the same kind of layout that most DJs use in clubs and it's not gonna be the like for like one for one but you can kind of get the feel of what it is to be a DJ by just downloading some free software and using your controllers on your own home and then if you want to kind of progress upwards you can get your own set of decks whatever it may be blah 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 and obviously you don't have to create the music you just download the music you buy the music you legally download it, whatever you want to do so the barrier of entry is really low and I think if you have decent enough taste and if you have an ear for recognizing what's working what's not working and you kind of figure out how to make mixing work for you because I remember when I first started DJing, I used to be obsessed with watching videos on how to beat match and all this sort of nonsense. It doesn't matter really. The more you go, and I think the key to it is going out a lot, going out a lot and going to see DJs or going to go to go into particular party promotions that you're not really familiar with and going to see people that you don't really know too tough and seeing what works or doesn't work, going to see really popular people that are commercially successful and seeing that they're not that great or seeing that they are amazing. Those are things that will open your eyes. And one thing it did open my eyes for me was that it made me realize quite soon when I got started in the scene was that mixing was never important. The most important thing was to have good taste and to have the ability to um, to sequence your set properly in, in the same respect as an album. It's, it's all well and good having your album mastered perfect you know to perfection but if the sequencing is all fucked up it doesn't really matter very much i mean some of the best albums in the world aren't really mixed that well but the sequencing is just impeccable you know each song kind of fits after each song and i think the same thing goes for a dj set and um so yeah so basically the barrier of entry is really low you know everyone can get involved cost of entry is, is basically you know nut peanuts for the most part and if you have a good taste, you have a good ear for what's working, what's not working, you can become pretty successful pretty quickly, especially if you've got a little, a little kind of, um, if you've got a little kind of a thing that you use that you kind of lean into, whether it is you're really attractive, whether it's, you've got like an interesting face, whether you've got a cool bit of style, whether you dance a particular way behind the decks, whatever it may be, quite interesting name, interesting background. If you've got that kind of thing on top as well, you can make it work pretty quickly for yourself. But again, it's still difficult to do. It's not like every single attractive guy or girl out there that DJs are successful and they're not it's really hard to kind of break through um so when you do see people breaking through it's kind of it kind of gives you some level of encouragement okay cool he did it so I can do it too because like I said it's a brutal brutal career to try to pursue it really really is difficult especially when you're starting because especially in the UK there's not many places to play if you're just getting started it makes sense as well because not a lot of clubs want to take a take a chance with somebody they don't know they don't want you to chase away with the punters um they don't want to hire you and pay you money and you don't bring anyone through the through the doors. There's a lot of onus on ticket sales and not a lot on kind of resident DJs and building a good community or scene around DJs and nights and days and whatnot. It's a bit mess, it's a bit of a mess. So it's really hard to get through. So when you do see these stories, it is quite comforting to know, okay, cool, it is possible. You just gotta put your head down, work, and then eventually things will come your way. That is what you'd hope would happen in it. But big up Freddie Moham anyway. Enough about me. Quickly read the news. It says, yeah, Bergan's new resident, Freddie Moham. There you go. The news was confirmed earlier today, July 25th, by the Berlin Club in-house booking agency, Ostergut, which now represents Moham. Um, he's the latest addition to the roster, which follows the likes of Lakuti. I said, yeah, I said this year alone, it was Lakuti, Sedef Adassi, and Jacko Jacko. Born on the outskirts of Berlin, nice again, a, a local person playing there, being a resident. Began, so if Mohan began, he's making waves as a producer in 2017, which he debuted his EP called, um, his EP landed via work records. Since then, he's also had records out on whatever that word is, um, Spandu, um, Clockworks, and plus collaborative EPs with Rod Had and most like most recently Ben Clock. So loads of Berlin alumni he's been established with. Mohan's first gig at Berlin resident was a club nurse on Saturday, the 24th of August, with Fidel, um, Nini Hayes, Robert Hood and more. Oh, I'm going to miss him on that weekend, unfortunately. So yeah, big up him. He's got a podcast out at the moment now with RA as well. So if you want to check that out, definitely go and check that out as well. He's got a recent episode that he put out on there. But yeah, big up Freddie Moham. It's nice to see you resident DJs being announced at Berkheim because it means that we all have a chance to. We all have a chance to. Moving on from that. What's going to speak about here quickly? Yes, move on, move on from there, move on from there. What's I going to talk about here? Let's move. Oh, let's talk about this. Yeah, let's talk about this. Have you guys seen this? Um, this stuff. So, concerning Guy Gerber, right? There's these reports going around that he might have R-worded somebody. 
and i don't really know what to believe to be completely honest i think some of these accounts when it comes to our world especially when it comes to dance music culture especially when it comes to nightlife it's just a little bit murky because of all the unnecessary add-ons that are involved in it, in terms of it being nighttime in terms of people being intoxicated in terms of people being drugged up in terms of people maybe looking for attention i don't know what's going on and then especially in terms of the industry as well i feel like there's a lot of kind of excuses made for certain people there's a lot of turning of the blind eye there's a lot of enabling especially when they're big names people don't want to lose the ability to have that person booked at the club because it's going to mean they're going to be able to make a certain amount of money at the gate or at the ticket sales or at the bar there's a really weird culture around dance music when it comes to these sort of accusations i feel like men or women don't really get the benefit of the doubt they probably should get just based upon especially if it concerns a really successful big person they don't really get that benefit of the doubt it seems to be a little bit they seem to be treated like shit really for the most part and there seems to be a lot of um, victim shaming and blaming so it's kind of hard for us as or for me as just a spectator from the outside to basically ascertain who's telling the truth and who isn't because it seems like two it seems like both parties have very different accounts of what actually happened do you know what I mean and this is courtesy of an account that I follow here on, on Twitter that's really good in terms of keeping up to date with some of the nefarious stuff that happens in dance music culture called um, Sam Karam and he says as follows Guy Gerber rape testimony sources is a person called Mavie Demars personal Instagram so this is the person I guess posted their um, account of what happened to them when they were with Guy Gerber the very famous tech house DJ so it says as follows trigger warning Guy, Guy Gerber R worded me, right? So this is kind of going from one to two. It says here, the incident I'll talk about took place in the morning of 21st of July, 2013 in Mykonos, Greece. And at the time I was 20 years old. So it was some time ago, it wasn't like a recent thing. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm curious to know what kind of spurred the person to kind of recount the story now, just in terms of curiosity. I know, but I would imagine some of these traumatic events, you know, there's stuff that kind of lingers in the head for a long time. And there is no real time, what's that thing called? There is no time limit on when you can tell your story, but I'm just curious to know what kind of prompted it now. Cause I know when I was following the whole Crystalia stuff, it was really interesting to read that the main girl that kind of accused Crystalia of what he was accused of. I think of like, you know, texting underage girls or whatnot. She basically said that she was watching you, that series on Netflix, which Crystalia was in. And she just saw him being promoted on online a lot. I think, you know, when those Netflix shows come on, I'm guessing her algorithm on YouTube was full of Crystalia content, him interviewing about the show, talking about his character, blah, blah, blah. And then he just kept getting plastered in front of her face. And it was like a constant reminder of like the douchebag that she kind of encountered. And she just had enough and just fired off a tweet. And then that set a snowstorm of everything that happened that obviously she led to his kind of brief cancellation, blah, blah, blah. So I'd be curious to know what kind of triggered this account. But anyway, we continue. Having received an invitation by my girlfriend, no, sorry, by a girlfriend of mine um, from Athens, Greece, I decided to join her and a couple of other friends for a boat party, for a boat trip, sorry, in Mykonos. I had met Guy Gerber about a year and a half prior to this for a mutual friend while he was in London playing a gig. Since we first met, we had briefly hung out in other social environments a couple of more times. On the way to Mykonos, I'd heard he was there, but didn't think much of it as my plan was to stay with my Greek friends. Two. As we arrived to the party, some of my London friends were there and Guy was with them. The night was quite a disaster, so I remember the details were very vividly, but to keep it short, it didn't stay. I didn't stay. We didn't stay long. We decided to leave in some of the London crew and the guy um, back to a friend's villa where he was also staying. Guy and another DJ friend played for us there. So a little bit of an after hours party. That's, that's I think, is the real... It's weird to say this because I think it's, it's all disgusting and it's all disrespectful, but just kind of hold me. Just kind of stay with me here. That I think is a real mark of disgusting disrespect thing, right? In terms of, I remember reading accounts of Harvey Weinstein's abuse, right? It was, it was, if it wasn't bad enough that he was abusing and taking advantage of these young, um, naive, up and coming actresses who just wanted to get in Hollywood at any means cost and were just, you know, enamored with the industry and were just willing to do whatever it took to get where I need to get to and he took advantage of that. That wasn't enough. The other gruesome part of it was that he was taking advantage of like assistants and like managers and like cleaners, like people that are just like the integral fiber of like holding up that Hollywood industry. Right? People that are kind of integral to making sure that your business runs smoothly. He was also taking a piss out of them. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's enough that you're damaging these young ladies who are kind of coming in doughy eyed and wide eyed industry. You're also kind of abusing the people that are like mainstays. So same with this, it's like, it's bad enough you're going to abuse random fans, but then actual people who are part of your inner circle, the ones that you would be having 
happy enough to jump in an Uber with, the ones you'd be happy enough to hang out in a groom with, the ones you'd be happy enough to invite back to your hotel room with, those are the ones you take advantage of. I mean, it's kind of gross that way. That's what that's what I really can't get my head around. But I guess if you're a monster that way, which I mean, whoever whoever's around you take advantage of, there is no kind of, you know, uh, delineation between wide-eyed naive person and somebody you've known for years I mean it's all kind of they're all kind of victims that you can kind of exploit which is horrendous but that's always a kind of common trait you hear about people that do this sort of stuff they always take advantage of people that are closest to them as well it's not just a random person it's always the closest person to them so that's why when people say I didn't know I didn't know you're lying everyone knew you're lying then that was quite a we decided to leave with some London crew to guy back with friends and a DJ there. I remember clearly Guy spending a lot of time talking to other mutual friends about the hard time he was having in Ibiza, as that was the summer he was doing his first event on the island, um, Wisdom of the Glove at Pasha. As the other guests left, I was going to leave too and realized that my phone battery had died, but the owner of the house and her fiance were in the far end of the pool, so I thought I would stay a little longer until they came out. He was just finishing playing, so I came to sit next to him, and that's when he offered me what he said was a line of stimulant drug and I shot of alcohol stimulant drug being coke or why did she say stimulant drug <laughs> seeing as I was um, sober and I tried to and I uh, sober and try and tired I thought it might not be a bad idea I never had any romantic interest in him or any attraction and all our exchanges until that point have never indicated anything of, of nature so I felt safe to hang out as a friend <sighs> that assumption man assumptions will lead you in trouble all the time in it always assumptions lead you in trouble man assuming things God damn, you can never assume in it. You have to always treat everybody as like a potential um as a potential assailant, unfortunately, especially if you're a woman anyway, a potential assailant. That's unfortunate, but it just is what it is. I saw my friends all the time. All my friends told me, Oh, it's annoying when you walk behind the girl and she catches her bag or starts running off behind him. It's like of course they would like I don't feel bad about that. Like, why should they give you the benefit of the doubt? They don't know who the hell you are. You could be anybody, do you know what I mean? You should treat everybody like a monster really until they prove you until they prove you different, really. And even then, keep your, keep your third eye open. Anyway, it continues. So when about 10 to 15 minutes later, I saw him leaning in to kiss me, I felt totally shocked and immediately wanted to push him away. But unfortunately, I could no longer move my arms, even if my head was screaming. What did he give her then? Like, it wasn't coke. Next, the last thing I remember is him putting his arm around me and walking me to his bedroom as my consciousness dimmed down to complete darkness like a dimmer switch. And I went into what was known as a r rufio induced state of automatic obedience root so she got roofied shit so i'll take back my coke comment jesus christ i regained my awareness about four hours four to five hours later waking up in total confusion next to him naked in the bed with zero recollection of anything that happened bruising that remained for almost three days which vividly tell a very much a very much remembered nine years later i managed to get myself together and go ask for the phone charger so i can charge oh my god this whole time my phone wasn't charged what a nightmare holy shit what a nightmare you stay to charge your phone you hang out with this superstar dj you have a bit of a line thinking yeah it's just gonna give me a bit of a pep and a bit of a shot just to kind of keep myself awake and have a bit of a chat afterwards and then you end up waking up in the bed naked and your phone isn't charged still um anyway i charge my phone make my way back to the boat where i was staying and fleeing and fleeing, fleeing as quickly as possible when i got to my friends immediately started having an emotional breakdown as i felt i really confused and disorientated at the time i had no idea that rufio is that how you pronounce it ruf ruf rufino or rufino rufino i think was or how it worked so i had reference to make sense of what went being so of what of what went from being sober to consuming a stimulant to sleeping with somebody I didn't desire and had no memory of. You know, this sounds like a lot to me. This sounds like a lot of the recent accounts I've been hearing about people in Berlin and stuff. I know it's happening everywhere, but so far there's been really loads of detailed accounts about people getting spiked in Berlin, in different places like Berghain, in places like Sisi Foss I saw the other day. Like it's happening a lot quite often. And people either getting spiked like with an actual needle or it's people getting spiked with people putting stuff in their drinks which is fucking crazy and i think the berlin club commission had to put out a note it's basically telling people to like hey mind your drinks be aware but it's pretty grim to hear man it's happening to men and women too just this weekend at the csd thing that happened in Berg Berg, and someone mentioned they got spiked as well dude so it's pretty crazy out there my boyfriend at the time then called me and said he was having horrible nightmares about me and asking anything could happen and i told him that happened and he had no idea how it happened oh my god imagine having to explain to your boyfriend and try basically because you'd imagine a boyfriend would immediately believe that it was not a rape or not an assault and you'd wanted it or something and you're already dealing with that trauma oh yeah 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 
As soon as enough dissociation and repression, and repression kicked in as a defense, and like many women who had had these experiences, I decided to pretend like it didn't happen, even when I saw him again. Very soon, however, I started feeling depressed, self-destructive, and my relationship became very toxic. Within six months, I knew I needed to get out of London and try to just understand what was going on with me. And luckily, at the very time, I'd received an offer to work with the project outside of the UK, which gave me the quiet I needed to begin the process of healing. Next page, let's see. How many pages over here? I think it's the last one, anyway. Right? Um, last page. A couple of months into my into uh, into my time there, I um, happened to stumble on an article about date rape. Okay, this is what's basically spurned it again. Um, an account of a girl who was given roof, you know. That's when I first realized I began to accept what happened to me as word for word and I had the same experience as she did. Since I accepted that happened with, to me, I began to talk about it with friends and acquaintances but never felt the courage to go public. A couple of times, a couple of those friends who knew Guy and confronted him about it to which he responded by explaining rumors and paid to me as a bad light in false stories whenever somebody responds to assault ac accusations by telling them it's rumors fake news and trying to paint the victim out to be a liar and shit and really being aggressive that way it's not a good sign and it's usually it kind of smells a bit fishy when someone does that i would assume having read these stories if you did nothing wrong you'd want to do like what bieber did in it and just stick to the facts and not get all hysterical and not try to put smart on the person's name just stick to the facts this is where i was at she said here i was there this is a picture of me here this is the, i mean you'd, you'd be like methodical in your explanation there'd be no emotion around it because you know you didn't do anything um in my opinion anyway but hey wanting to redeem myself for not speaking out and preventing this happening to other women i began to feel inspired to create an event and movement to make this island safer for women and to stand against abuse my intention going ahead with this is to stop more women from being are you promoting your own night at the end of your abuse story? My intention going ahead with this is to stop more women from, full, from being raped like I was, helping Abifa become a leader and stand against the toxic culture from the health of the future generations. If you have more uh, information, would like to support, uh, support the movement. Our, our time is now, Abifa. Come on, girl, man. That's a, li that's a little bit distasteful and a bit gross. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm selling tickets now, buy my book. Like, come on, man. Like, have some respect for yourself. Like, yuck, in that regard. But... The story still remains um, pretty disturbing. Now, one thing I'd like to just point out there is that, that just interests me. I don't know what's real and what's not, what happened, what didn't happen. It's just interesting to me how, for the most part, these stories do absolutely nothing in terms of affecting the person that's accused. Zero. They do nothing. I've had read many of these accounts on my podcast beforehand. I've spoken about it ages ago before and other people too. But it does absolutely nothing. It really does nothing. And I wonder why that is with dance music. And don't tell me because it's a male-dominated industry. It's not really. Most of the people who work behind the scenes in this industry, um, they're not men. Most of them are women, especially people that work within the overall hospitality industry. So to say it's definitely a men's issue is I just don't think that really cuts it, to be completely honest. I want to know what is about dance music and electronic music in general. What is it about this kind of scene that allows people to just get, quote unquote, not get away with it, but you know, in most industries or most sectors, if you get accused of something like this, you have to have a bit of a time out. But for the most part, even if there's evidence, even if there's detailed accounts, it takes a lot for people to really kind of tell you, time out, you're kind of quote unquote cancelled. It takes a lot. Most people aren't going to care. Most people are still going to book you. Most people are still going to be associated with you and stuff. It's really bizarre. And I don't know why it is. I really haven't gotten down to the bottom of it. Why is it that dance music culture in general just tolerates a lot of this abuse stuff more than any other industry or scene that i've seen in public anyway it seems to always happen no matter the scale of the person it could be somebody very local it could be somebody as famous as guy gerber they seem to be able to get away with whatever they seem to be able to just to get away with it and again he might not have done it who knows but in terms of just the accusations for him to come out with an accusation like that and it not affect you at all and you not be able to miss a beat and just keep it moving it's a bit mad but anyway this is guy gerber's account of the of the of what happened um so it's just from the instagram account four weeks ago it says i woke up a few days ago to a waterfall of messages and i was completely shocked when i heard maybe dimar's post i actually remember the day i met her because Good on you to remember that, mate. I played in a small villa party attended by mainly friends and an owner. I was DJing that night until very late the next day. And yes, I remember Maeve. Since the, she came near me multiple times throughout the night trying to get my attention. So again, he's trying to make her sound like a slut. You got to love this sort of stuff, innit? I also remember that I thought it was weird because she was with another guy. So the boyfriend was there, but she was trying to... Oh my God. So what she's saying, she was... She, was, she had a boyfriend at home 
and there was another guy there that she was hooking up with and also Guy Gerber. God love it. What a gentleman. The party kept on going and at some point most of the people left. Maybe, however, stayed by my side and waited until everybody went to sleep. So she was clearly, he's basically saying she was clearly, you know, a DTF. He, he ended up, we ended up going to one of the rooms in the villa and had sex until we slept. When we woke up, she told me that she felt guilty about her boyfriend. I was a bit surprised because she said that they were in an open relationship. But then she said that she still needs to explain it to him. After that, we never stayed in touch. She never contacted me, but I saw her at least once during one of my shows. Maybe claimed in her post that I used some sort of drug in her drink and raped her. This is an ugly lie. I would never do such a thing. And to be extremely clear, she was totally aware of her doings. Mavia is truly is trying to hurt my name, but I do not intend to stay silent. I decided to take legal actions against her, and the first working day after the facts my lawyer filed, our first motion to the court attached. Have I have no doubt the Spanish courts will unveil the truth. So what's he gonna do? Is he gonna sue her? Okay, this is an interesting development. He's actually going to sue her, huh? Just for you to know, I waited a few days after for commenting this, hoping things would clear up on their own, because I was thinking that everybody that reads it will know that it's totally untrue. Why would we know that? Well, we don't know you, brother. Like, huh? I obviously preferred not to post such graphic descriptions of my personal life on my page. Um, as much as the last few days have been like hell for me, as you can imagine, I will not diminish my support of the Me Too movement. It will not diminish my support. <laughs> Yo, this guy called her a whore. Uh, he called her a liar. He said he's going to sue her. And then he said he's me too. The guy's hitting it all, isn't it? God damn it. Um, it, would not be, it, it would not diminish my support of the Me Too movement anyway. In a call, and I call on you to continue to support and believing in the important movement. Finally, I want to thank all the love and support I've, I've got for so many people around me and from the industry. Some of them are not even my friends. It's a very difficult time for me, but I will get through this and come out of it stronger. I was actually talking to a girl the other day and she said she doesn't believe the girl. She says she believes Guy Gerber. And she says a lot of girls in the dance music industry behind the scenes, because I'm not really, you know, I tried to keep myself away from the group. I think I had a conversation with somebody the other day about guest lists and stuff. I don't care about guest lists and all that malarkey. I much prefer to have guaranteed that I know I'm going to get into a club. Imagine if it's an in-demand nightclub. Maybe it's nice to have a guest so you can get in, so you don't have to queue for hours outside. That's fair enough. But I don't care about green rooms. I don't care about all that stuff. I don't really care. Do you know what I mean? That kind of back room, trying to get in with the people and whatnot. I want to be an artist in terms of being a DJ, and I want to be appreciated for my art, not because people like me to be around and shit. That's a bit, you know, it's not how I want to roll. But I remember this girl telling me that, people that are about that life and do love the green room life and like to hang out with djs and you know have lines behind the booth and stuff and whatnot they kind of play up to this you know they basically um offer themselves to djs and people do you know what i mean they kind of go out of their way to be like okay i slept with the most djs and whatnot and maybe so she definitely thinks that this girl is one of them and this is a girl girl not like a you know whatever this is like a woman basically saying yeah she doesn't believe them so again there's something i want to know if you know in the comments there's something intrinsic about dance music community where it doesn't really benefit favor or believe victims it's always really just a victim shaming kind of industry for the most part the benefit of that always gets given to the artist however big or small they are it's very strange. Maybe because there's a lot of, maybe because it's an artist, isn't it? Because if you're a DJ, you're an artist, so you have fans. So naturally your fans don't want to see you cancelled because they love you. They want to support you. So if an accusation does come out about you, have a heinous, they're going to not want to believe it because they want to see you play at the next festival, the next gig. Maybe that's why, I don't know. Anyway, continue. Finally, I want to thank all the love and support. Da, da, da. This is a very difficult time for me, but I will get through this and come out of it stronger. And of course, this is the filing he put forward about the charge. This is in Spanish. I can't read it. Um, but yeah, it looks like he's suing the girl. Absolutely crazy, isn't it? So he's taking it seriously. He's not really playing around. Um, but yeah, I don't know what to believe. I don't know who's to believe in this story. Um, I just, like I said, think it's unfortunate that I'm a, I'm a little bit of a weirdo when it comes to dance music and industry and stuff. Cause I'm a little bit of an idealist. I would, I would actually love if the industry or if the scene overall was some sort of version of a utopia, if we could create this space where for six hours, seven hours, eight hours, 10 hours, however long the party last, you could essentially be yourself, be free with no threat of violence, of assault, of abuse or anything. It doesn't need to be the most comfortable space, whatever it may be, but the stuff that you're kind of used to encountering in your everyday life for once, for once in that space, for those few hours, you just get to kind of let your hair down and just be free. 
that's what I remember experiencing the first time I went to Berlin, right? For the first time, because in London, our kind of clubbing culture is very constrained in terms of tickets, in terms of times you can get in, in terms of security checks, in terms of the attitudes around drugs, in terms of the drink prices. Well, it's, there's a lot of constraints. So you have to kind of fight against a lot of things before you can get to enjoy yourself. But when you first go to a place like Berlin, the first thing you realize is that, oh shit, this is what clubbing culture on the highest level should be about, right? This is what it should be about. This is what you should be doing. This is like the, the pinnacle, the kind of the... the the kind of top of the mountain sort of like level of it right the apex predator of flipping clubbing because you essentially get to let your head down there's no pictures being taken on the dance floor there's no heavy-handed security the, drug, the acceptance of drug culture is really cool everyone's having a good time everyone wants to dance blah 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 now it would be nice if everywhere around the world had its own version of such things so you could go to a place and just know you could be cool you could be calm you could be easy you could be carefree without having the threat of somebody touching you up somebody trying to abuse you somebody trying to harass, harass you whatever it may be just in that space whatever happens afterwards it will happen afterwards but in that clubbing space it would be nice to have that utopia but unfortunately as I sometimes say it's good to operate in the world as is as opposed to how you'd want it to be so in reality for us to expect a club to be a utopia is really naive or myself is really naive and dumb and full-heartedly because you know a club is like anywhere else in the world any other space there's always going to be monsters and people lurking around the corner willing to do you damage especially if you let your guard down so you essentially have to keep your guard up at all times which is again really really frustrating and annoying if you're a girl because you just want to go out and enjoy yourself but it's kind of a common thing you kind of have to keep your eye on and i guess if you're a dj you also have to be mindful that not everyone that comes around you that kind of wants to you know get jiggy with you is well-intentioned maybe some of them that are coming around you actually want to see you burn for whatever reason so you kind of have to be on your p's and q's also and make it a mission to maybe be a little bit picky and selective about who you end up sleeping with at the end of the night because i'd imagine the temptation is pretty grand because you're a dj you're commanding that entire space you're basically you know taking them on a journey sending them left right up and down all around whatever it may be and i'm sure that kind of intensifies attraction and the fact that you're very good at your job the fact that you're getting a lot of adulation a lot of attention it's gonna make you attracted to certain people but you have to be selective you have to be really picky about who you try to hook up with and get with because this sort of hassle just doesn't seem worth it really for a little cuddle and a little bonk guy at the end of a clubbing session or at the end of an after hours you probably don't remember that well which is a little bit extra in my opinion but again who to believe i'm not really too sure force of feelings go out to the victim of course because it sounds like a harrowing story and i guess we have to kind of let it play out in the courts and go from there really in it but an interesting kind of development they ended up actually suing the girl that i actually didn't know about but yeah big up what's going on over there anyway moving on this is a story it's a bit long this one it's a bit brutal so please bear with me but essentially i'm not sure if you've noticed i've, I've spoken about this person a few times here on my uh, podcast called nastia nastia is a dj who i kind of only got really jiggy to um during the pandemic really um mainly because of her youtube channel which was really good at the start she kind of interviewed some really cool people within her kind of local scene um you know people that are from the surrounding areas of ukraine and russia and stuff and people just you know within a kind of extended friendship group and it was a really good even though it was in russian or whatever language they were speaking at the time whoever she's speaking to i'm not sure if it was record whatever it may be they did surprise subtitles but they were always really detailed accounts i guess because they're not that what well, maybe not that well, i don't know where it was but they're some of the better interviews i've seen people concerning clubbing culture dance music culture techno music production in general there's a lot of real detailed answers a lot of a lot of kind of stories about coming up and what they did blah 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 and i really love that whole series that she put together on the youtube channel really really well put together but as a person she's a little bit annoying and i think at the beginning i tried to get i tried to actually arrange a couple of interviews to kind of have a just to kind of understand what goes through the mind of this person overall but after a while i kind of got put off by it because she's got a very um I say divisive kind of personality, especially online, because I think a lot of people kind of got turned off from her, from her kind of um, TMI post on social media, where she'd be like detailing her bad set, like, oh, it set went badly, and being an absolute, you know, drama queen and big baby about a set gone wrong, or somebody up, somebody basically, you know, outshining her on a lineup or something, just nonsense things, like, you know, real first world problems type of stuff. It's like, dude relax shut the fuck up no one cares it's not that big of an issue like keep it moving and all these kind of you know tmi posts on social media with like 70 million paragraphs so it was always a bit annoying then in the pandemic she kind of ramped up her level of annoying by deciding to be one of only a few djs who decided that you know 
they needed to perform they needed to earn a living at the behest or at the kind of detriment of the safety of the world out there right especially at the peak of the pandemic now we know that the pandemic maybe wasn't as big as an issue as they kind of once as we once believed it to be maybe they made it more they made more of it than what it seemed to be but at the time when it was at its peak and places in the third world and third world countries kind of you know quote unquote were really suffering but they were also had leadership and politicians who were basically willing to leave the, the kind of you know their kind of uh, borders open in order to invite foreign um, tourists to come over because obviously the economy was suffering and they were basically willing to sacrifice the health and safety of their citizens for the money that was coming in from tourists and clubs whatever it may be now, some of these were taking advantage of that right and basically saying hey well if the law says that we can go there we're going to go there and it was not having any kind of morals or ethics or principles behind it it was just if the law says yes I kind of go so that we call them play, de- play graves right? play graves and play DJs and stuff that were kind of going around the world and just playing and not really giving a shit about everything was going on and Nasha was one of the main people doing it right she went to I forgot where she went somewhere like Colombia and stuff and started writing stuff about whatever just nonsense right Perspect- in terms of optics it just looked horrible and she came out of it really bad in terms of pandemic reputation wise then as luck would have it or luck would have it not really luck because you know take it back because many people died it's been absolutely horrible but the war obviously in ukraine happened right when the invasion of russia into ukraine started suddenly nasty obviously being a ukrainian um, citizen um kind of amped up the kind of uh presence online in terms of talking about issues concerning ukraine and the local community and the scene overall and just kind of really kind of fighting that good fight online and she completely sort of changed the narrative on herself online overnight, it felt like, by getting behind the whole Ukraine thing, which was really interesting. But then, of course, in typical Nasia fashion, she still found a way to annoy people by then going extra hard at somebody like a Nina Kravis because Nina Kravis wasn't coming out and completely admonishing Putin for whatever reason, maybe because she's pro-Putin, maybe because she doesn't want to talk about politics, maybe because she doesn't care, who knows. But for whatever reason, Nasia thought it to, Nasia was kind of like, for it to be her right and her kind of... Um, calling to essentially be the person to say you know nina kravis is a bad person because she's not speaking out about the atrocities that her country um fellow countrymen are basically um subjecting ukrainian people to which she has a point you know especially if you see some of the footage that's going on in ukraine you see some of the accounts you see some of the early footage i saw of that little girl you know on a bicycle playing around in the car park it looks like and then boom a missile comes it completely obliterates the entire space and you don't get to see any part of her anymore just a bike absolutely horrendous the most recent thing i saw was a lady um, who had a child with Down syndrome the kid passed away and she has her leg amputated because it blew up because of a missile or bomb absolutely heinous stuff so if you're from there or if you just got a heart and you're human it's pretty difficult to see that happening and then see your local or see your kind of fellow peers in the industry who you basically think as kind of brothers and sisters or people that are kind of near you in terms of location whatnot be completely silent it can be kind of frustrating i can actually understand why that could be infuriating to the point where you just want to remind people every single day but it got a little bit nauseating after time because it's like look everyone's allowed to say and not say what they want in public concerning these certain things some people have a very strict policy about not talking about things such as politics at all in public some people are a bit more free with this sort of stuff i think to expect people to kind of respond the way you want to respond is a little bit heinous but also i think as a fan if you was a fan of nina kravis and she didn't say nothing that you liked about the whole ukrainian war the good thing about social media the good thing about nowadays is that if they don't line up with your politics or your worldview you can immediately stop 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 stop, stop kind of supporting them you don't they don't need to be forced down your throat anymore that's a good thing kind of thing but anyway we move so it looks like Nash's next target going forward has, is going to be daria and etap kyle because I saw this post randomly on her Telegram. She's got a Telegram account where she essentially uses it as a platform to basically whinge and moan, right? To basically everybody that's that's on her account that follows her. It's basically an open diary that says, yeah, and it definitely is an open diary. There's too much words written on here. And I've taken many screenshots and to kind of make this legible. But essentially, um, Nastya has a beef with Etap Kyle and Daria um, called Kovosa, specifically, I guess, because they're not really responding or replying or basically acting out um, regarding the war in Ukraine the same way that she wants it to be worth, or maybe because of her affiliation with Nina Kravis I'm not really too sure but I'm going to read through the whole thing and we're going to try and get an understanding of the whole situation but this is Nastya v Dario Kovosa v Etap Kyle it's an absolutely crazy thing because if I'm not mistaken Dario Kovosa and Etap Kyle are in a relationship so she essentially is going after two people who are fairly who she was basically fairly close to a while back and you know completely completely destroying any kind of future relationship because I guess she's not happy with their association with certain people but hey let's move 
So it says as follows, who is Diary Kovalsa? Uh, sorry, Kolosova, my biggest mistake, disappointment and shame. It's interesting too, because I remember, if I remember correctly, just to continue, before I continue, the, the best interview actually on Nina Kravitz, sorry, on Nastia's account on YouTube is the interview with Daria. She talks about this really interesting scene that she came up in DJing wise where she had to go play in China at these topless DJ party things where they basically got paid a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars a gig. They all lived in some sort of quote unquote whorehouse or pimp's house it looked like and they got basically put in a, in a, in a camper van and got taken around to all these different random clubs around China where these businessmen in suits used to sit and they'd have to DJ behind a deck's topless with like glitter on them or something basically no bra but you know they could put like paint or something on top of them while they dj fucking crazy and she graduated from that really cringy thing into playing you know amazing techno clubs pretty interesting story i recommend you go check it out but anyway continues the story began in autumn 2018 i was i was burning out and losing myself in what i was doing i was really struggling girl she's always a victim and always a victim anyway um i was really struggling and not feeling happy after a while of suffering i informed my agent and manager that i would leave the scene and retire soon yeah attention seeker and a fucking victim the only thing that was bothering me was my achievements and profile appeal <laughs> the ego of this woman i thought it was wrong to leave nuts to be a really to be i wonder if to be a really good dude you have to be incredibly narcissistic isn't it? you really do have to believe the world absolutely revolves around you legit if she retired tomorrow the world wouldn't miss her too tough like you'd be a couple of heart emoji broken heart emojis in your instagram account and that would be it people just move on like relax I thought it was wrong to leave um to leave it was just like that and i, I leave my management without a job as i was have always been in his main artist i start oh yeah the the, the fucking um hey, let me stop commentating let me just read it i started to think to, to share what i have with somebody else and who could be the only one to pass along my developments leaving everything i have created with no use to anyone was not a situation that i felt like i must bring to someone else open the door to somebody else so, duh, duh. there were two options in my mind um both what DJs from me from Ukraine. After much thought, I reached I chose Dario Kovalsa. <laughs> I chose you. You should be I wanna back then she was nobody. <laughs> she was doing her best to get a place on the scene, but Ukrainian community was not accepting her for some reason. One of the main one of one of them was the fact that her earlier work was uh, she was a topless DJ, DJ Igla from yeah, so I said from Lug from L Lug Lug Lugansk. So no one was taking her seriously. I took some action to defend her, support her. As I love challenges, I decided she is the right one to take over as I have to go through some hard times to get the respect from the scene when I was DJ Beauty. DJ Beauty, you know? Fucking hell. The thing you have to do to make it in DJing is just horrendous. DJing in a fucking topless DJ circuit and then calling yourself DJ Beauty because you're hot, using your hotness to kind of get gigs, but then also making sure people don't, take advantage of you behind the scenes brutal they probably got some stories to tell in it i was not playing topless though but people would also perceive me as an entertaining dj with, with a cheesy image i had to work hard to get respect from uh, i about to say i wasn't totally playing topless but i was very hot she just said anyway i had to work hard to get respect from the scene and get the chance to get to get where i am right now the feeling of women's solidarity clicked inside we had lots of things in common so my path resonated with hers when i was booked for armor 17 event in berlin in 2019 i wrote to Nast uh, natasha abel that i'm planning to retire and i want to share what i have with daria and bring her instead of me natasha respected my message and accepted it and agreed so you're telling me that not daria has only been around since 2019 properly on the scene fuck me so so nasha did definitely help her out in, in terms of her career because she's everywhere now from 2019 only that boost anyway let's continue um and agreed that I can share my slot for, for our first B2B event in Funk House. So I did, and it was a beginning. And of course, that's what it takes really in DJing. You play one good set in a really established place, and you've got the good look about you and stuff, and you've got a good co-sign, and immediately that can kind of propel you. But to get that set is the hardest thing in the world. Um, I was the one to recognize her potential and make my agent believe in her. I brought her to the agency and started to work on pushing her forward. My ex-manager helped me to add Dari for her first boiler room. I was booked at Pasha during... Uh, I in 2019 and made our b2b we added her to major festivals to play with me to help her grow and get recognition she did the podcast for awakenings instead of me because i couldn't do it by that moment we gave her all the opportunities that i couldn't take and offered her instead of me all the promoters that wanted to book me it's jesus the way she's putting it she's making it seem like this girl owes her entire career to her now if somebody owes if you owe somebody if some if you owe somebody your career does that mean you should agree with everything they do can you not speak out of turn about them at all? I don't know. What do you guys think? 
is somebody giving you a start like I've had a similar sort of issue kind of on a very small scale with somebody that kind of you know gave me a very great job on a flipping silver platter but then he turned into a fucking you know turned into a cunt but I he was always a bit of a cunt but I recognized it later on and I kind of called him out on it and I haven't really spoken to him in a good way since to be honest apart from a brief interaction here and there and um someone i remember once telling me that oh you should never speak out of turn of somebody that brought you in she always have respect it's like nah bruv like if somebody pisses you off they piss you off doesn't matter what respect they got don't be going there's still a reverence i'm always going to have for that person for giving me the opportunity to have that job in the first place on a silver platter i still have to interview and kind of smash that interview but the opportunity to get the interview was obviously something that i don't take for granted but when they become a dick you're allowed to respond to them like they're a dick. You shouldn't just be like, oh, they gave me a job, they helped me out, and I should just ignore the dickhead stuff they're doing or how they're talking to you with no respect and shit. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken. It's, it's continue. It's not about me. It's continue. Um, I was believing I'm doing something good. Slowly, I started to feel better myself and decided not to retire, but keep on pushing her with me at the major events and festivals. We did a lot together and became friends. Later on, I even chat, started to call her my sister as we got really close while touring together. You'd imagine. August 2019, I was playing in Ibiza, I invited Daria to come with me to introduce her to some people around. It was at this trip where I introduced her to Etap Kyle. Oh my God. She not only gave her a career, restored her image after playing at those topless parties because I guess she wasn't getting the respect that she needed. She also introduced her to her fucking future hubby and BF, or her future boyfriend and potential hubby. Crazy, isn't it? So now she feels like, nah, you owe me, bitch. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whose side I'm on now. <laughs> At first, I was against Nashi. Now I'm thinking, Daria, man, you you might owe this girl like your life. I think. Anyway, um, uh, that was a trip where I introduced her to Etab Kyle because he was on the island and offered me to and offered me to meet. Already that day, it was obvious they liked each other. Ah, okay. What was he get trying to get a threesome or something, or he just wanted to meet her? I don't know. Let's continue. After much efforts and promotion from my personal side, my agent started to build Diary's independent schedule for gigs. She was getting there, and then the pandemic has arrived. Meanwhile, some of the Ukrainian promoters still didn't want to book her, and sometimes had to use my influence or power to push her. Shit. So what's why is Diary's? <clears throat> If you're from Ukraine, please tell me what's what's wrong with Dari's reputation out there in Ukraine? Surely it's not just a topless DJ thing. Is a topless DJ thing that big of an issue? Are you guys such um, chin strokers and musical snobs that you don't take someone serious that comes from that circuit? Like they can't be serious. Because I remember Dari saying in that interview actually that some of the girls that play that topless DJ thing, some of them just didn't even DJ. They just had a mix playing and they pretend like they're DJing. But some obviously some of the girls on there were taking as a, as a serious opportunity to actually play in front of people, get better, and obviously try and build from that. Um, but I wonder what was the actual deal in Ukraine? Why are you guys so against? Uh, from what Nash just said, I'm not sure if this is true. This could be just lies to make Nash just seem like a to seem like fucking Jesus Christ. I don't know, but I'm interested to know if you're from Ukraine or from that scene. Let me know in the comments why she's getting the cold shoulder in your country so much. Meanwhile, some of the Ukrainian promoters didn't want to book her. I was standing by her side as I believed that what I was doing. I saw the results of my job about her and the way that she was working. So I was proud of both of us. In 2020, during isolation and the wavy lockdowns in Ukraine, I started the N NCHTO events and of course Daria was part of it. Besides that, I made an interview with her for my new True Talk interview, which I checked out project and we played together for my Beatport residency. In 2021, Etap Kyle moved to Kiev. They started to live together. Since that moment, her behavior has changed. <laughs> Standard, isn't it? When someone gets a relationship, this is always the worst thing in friendships, isn't it? When somebody gets their first boyfriend or their first serious boyfriend or girlfriend or somebody that they're seriously in love with, like legitimately, it is quite brutal to go from being the center of their universe to being like an additional add-on whenever they whenever they can be bothered to call you or to remember you're alive. It really is brutal. You go from texting each other and having replies every second to suddenly having to reply every couple of days, maybe a week later, crazy stuff. They don't include you in their plans. They don't really check up on you. It's just a bit brutal to kind of get in. And I guess with girls, it's even worse because girls have a really girl best friends have far more close relationship than boys best friends i'd imagine right in terms of sharing everything and going out and whatnot especially if you're both single so to sort of go from hanging out with each other all the time especially djing wise to suddenly changing it i'd imagine also because these promoters are fucking janky i'd imagine once daria and etap kyle started dating there was some sort of talk behind the scenes that they started to book them on more similar dates we don't want to be alone we don't want to be you know apart from each other we want to play the same set i mean i'd imagine some of that so they're definitely spending a lot more time together than they would do anyone else so that must be brutal to deal with but it continues 
um, since that moment her behavior started to change she would see me less she would not come to my place when I invited them to my friends dinners a few times she was not sharing her goals and news with me anymore bruv honestly this is a bit how, how, how old is Nastia because this is a bit this is a bit weird man how old is she Nastia DJ age because I don't know man she's 35 years old how old is fucking Daria because this seems a bit weird isn't it like you're just kind of bothered about this shit I guess it's annoying, but hmm, Daria Kovosa agency. Oh, she doesn't put her age there. We don't know how old she is. Uh, we have no idea how old this lady is. Daria Kovosa birthday. Oh, so about the same age. Okay, they're about the same age. Okay, not my bad. I'll take it back. They're about the same age. Um, I started to feel there is... Um, it says here she was born on February 1897. So they're about the same age. They feel there's something wrong going on, but kept on supporting and accepting. This February, just before the war started, we were supposed to leave together on February 24th. I was booking flights to EU with my daughter in Dari with Itap Kyle called me the day before February 23rd to find out some info about what's going on. They didn't share with me that they got married that day. Oh, really? They got married? But were seeking for useful information. She booked the same flight as us, but the war arrived earlier and I was the one who called Daria. Woke up her and told her to leave immediately. When the war started in Ukraine, it trying to dance music scene. Community made the open letter to the... Uh, oh, did I, did I do it twice? Oh, no. Oh, I didn't print screen it properly, did I? Oh, let me see if I can see it. The fall of Ukraine, 21st final final was going on. Signed a letter. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the open letter for the international dance music scene in order to boycott Russian artists. Uh, Daria and Etel Kyle have signed a letter on the day when everyone was posting it they also did it but then they couldn't handle the negative feedback from the international audience so they'd hid their post because they couldn't manage the criticism and negative comments from their followers <laughs> they did it in order not to risk their positions opportunities and bookings <laughs> and the amount of followers for what they got highly criticised by the Ukrainian community for stepping back for their actions so in a, what kind of world is this so in, in some sort of bizarre world I don't know if this is actually true. Maybe it is the most true. Etap Kyle and Daria put up post um, kind of asking the local or industrial community to boycott Russian artists as a response to the Russians' invasion of Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They then get loads of blowback from international audience that's not Russian. For the most part, everything I heard online, reception-wise, regarding the war the the Ukrainian sorry the Russian Ukrainian invasion the the Russian invasion of Ukraine especially in the beginning was mostly ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent of it was pro Ukrainian so I find it hard to believe at that time there was an element online especially on Instagram that was saying oh you guys are going against your mor whatever that was very pro Putin pro Russia I don't really believe that's true I don't, I don't know if that is true but let's just believe what she says here. They did it in order to not risk their positions, their opportunities in bookings and the amount of followers for what they got highly criticized for being like for the Ukrainian community for stepping back on their actions. Daria told me that they were already moving to Berlin in the beginning of February, so they don't care much for what Ukrainian scene and community think of them. <laughs> Holy shit, of course, once a war kicks off and, you know, the local community needs them, they, they fucking put their tails behind their bums and head off to Berlin. If I understand why Daria's pissed off, but, you know, they, they, they can do what they want. They're grown-ups, isn't it? The war is happening in Ukraine, and you need to. They, so essentially, what it seems like, Itap Khan moved to Kiev to follow his girl. The war kicks off, and then they have to move again to obviously escape the war, and then they go to Berlin. I don't see the problem in this really, but hey, this conversation happened when we met on the 19th of March in Amsterdam during the dinner before the Vault Sessions charity event in Amsterdam 2020. Before that, the last time we saw each other was the beginning of October when I realized it was a surprise. When I realized it, I was surprised by how long we weren't seeing each other, considering the fact that we were living with the same city. Then me and my Ukrainian partners um, decided to organize a charity event in NYC in July 1st, and I invited Daria because she was part of it. She refused my proposal, saying she's playing free time for Vault Sessions in Amsterdam that weekend, and she's so excited about it. I mentioned that Vault Sessions are friends, and we can ask them to reschedule thinkies for another weekend, but she still wasn't so enthusiastic about my idea, letting me know she doesn't want to change anything to an accept it. <laughs> Uh, there was one moment where she was giving her all the gigs then then another moment Daria, um, Daria girl turns around and is like nah nah you're, you can keep that you can keep that gig I'll stay here in Amsterdam thank you very much next to hubby in the beginning of April I started to work on some cancellations of the festivals where I was in the same lineup of Russian silent artists in the same time Ukrainian community was fighting for it too and when Glitch Festival was announced their full lineup of one of the main Ukrainian fighters Maya Bakal Bak, Bak Back Lanova 
was left a comment under their post. It says as follows, Daria Key and Etap Co. Guys, what, guys, while the whole Ukrainian scene is fighting against Russian artists in the lineups, you both just reset all our efforts while playing with them at the same festivals. Money or pride or dignity? Money, pride or dignity? They didn't react. Typical reaction from this couple. They didn't react to the this couple while the Ukrainian scene was... Yeah, that's true. I guess what they're saying. If there's, if there's a solidarity behind U Ukrainian artists and they're both Ukrainian, right? Um, it is a bit strange that they'll be on the same lineup as other artists. But again, I just don't think it's fair to expect everybody to, re to react to stuff that's going on in the world the same as you are. Regardless if it's kind of real, it's kind of stuff that's hitting home because it's your home country. Regardless of stuff that's really close to you in terms of issues that you're really caring about, I don't think it's fair to expect everybody else to react the same way you react. What I do think is cool is that when these issues do arise, they're pretty good in terms of highlighting and showing up the people that shouldn't be in your life. If these, this is really a key part of your identity. If you really believed in dealing with world issues and politics and whatever's happening in affairs and inequality, da 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 da, and there's certain people in your scene or in your peer group who don't care about those kind of things to a really destructive level or to a level that you can't take anymore, you can just X them out of your life. You, they, they don't need to hide behind things. You know what I mean, because it's pretty blatant when they don't want to support it or when they don't have any feelings towards it or when they have feelings that don't really line up to how you look at it. But to come out and out people like this and whine about them in public is a little bit gross, in my opinion. But again, you're free to do what you want to do. Um, while the whole Ukrainian scene was fighting against injustice, fighting for justice or an Ukrainian topic in the general, was completely ignored by Daria and Etap Kar since February 24th. And they were behaving like they are not Ukrainians at all. Check their IG posts and you will not find anything about the situation in Ukraine besides reposting some stories they did nothing. Because speaking out was always been discomfort and discomfort. Com discomfort and confrontation zone you can't step in if you are if you are love dependent narcissist opportunist love dependent narcissist opportunist how can she sometimes i wonder as well like does she not know what she did during the whole playground stuff is that not an issue is that completely okay because i guess it's a silent killer it's not like as gruesome as seeing kids and, and ladies and mums and old people getting blown up to bits in the street but if you go to different countries and you inadvertently spread covid around during the peak peak horror times of covid when we had no idea it was as probably not serious or mild as it is now it's not like much of an issue but then because your friends aren't reposting or posting stuff about ukraine every single minute of the day they seem to be more egregious than you i don't know man i don't know i think going to i, I don't know would you com could you compare being silent about Ukra the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and performing at playgraves? Like, what's the actual worst offense, especially at the peak of the playgrave, when people are looking? Especially if you're flipping last year, right? You're an international quote unquote commercial DJ who gets paid again not to pocket watch, but you get paid probably more than five thousand euros per gig. Let's say more than three thousand to be to see that modest more than 3,000 per gig, probably up, was up until 30 or something crazy like that, especially if you look at somebody like, um, I forgot the other person who just said that he gets paid if rates wise, but imagine someone like that and people think, okay, you should, you should be okay, but then you're still going out and playing these crazy raves in these far-flung places um, and not really giving a shit, posting yourself up all over there, taking pictures, being, I mean, just, I don't know. I just find this a little bit rich coming from her personally, but again, it was already obvious which direction they chosen. Leave in the comment, I have another word for you, shame, under Nasir Krevis' peace post. Daria is feeling okay to play with her and other Russian careless artists in the same lineup because her career is more important than unity. Okay, cool. She's playing with, ooh, that's a big one. She's playing with um, Nina Kravis, who's the kind of, uh, the, the person that Nasir seems to hate the most. Her career is more important. Um, in the order to make a change and difference to the name of the home and country. When I started to see it and started to analyze these things properly, it was hard for me to realize what that solid number of international artists unite to give support to Ukraine and Serg and Sergei with Daria pretend nothing special is happening, refusing to the office of her colleagues to unite and pull up to our festivals where they share the lineup with Russian ignorant artists. This makes no difference because between them and those Russians, because the principles are the same. Keep on silent and save your ass and sake of your own business. People will talk a bit and then forget which is unfortunately true people did talk a bit especially in the beginning when she was really being silent about it but now probably people don't care that whole band thing that she had people don't really give a shit about and personally for me i don't really feel like there should be this kind of blanket cancellation of people i feel like if you're running a festival or a club night and you are extremely politically active and you do care about these issues and seeing last year or seeing 
Nina Kravitz not be vocal or Sina should be vocal, they should inform your booking policy. If you're pro Putin, you should be like, cool, I'm not going to book Daria. If you're if you're not going to book Nasha, sorry, if you're pro, if you're anti Putin, you should be like, cool, I'm going to book flipping whatever. You know what I mean, you should be your politics should really guide your booking principles. But also, I understand from a business point of view, especially post pandemic. These clubs have taken a brutal beating, especially ones that are like outside the the key kind of um, cities around Europe and stuff. They've taken absolute beatings. So the last thing they can do is be picky about who plays, who doesn't play, because they essentially need the money to come through those doors and need bums and seats and need drinks to be sold in order to make sure that they can survive another season to pay their staff to keep that local community going to pay local DJs like, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes around local, local community that goes around economy that goes around the whole of that club culture so it's not as easy just to say the clubs don't book this person and it's also not as easy to say to the artists who have been out of work for ages I comes again myself I'm a very mediocre level DJ in terms of like my great not in terms of my skill level my skill level is obviously high but in terms of where i'm playing at i'm fairly low in terms of playing at local bars and pubs and stuff and even my gigs are completely dried up from what they used to be pro pre-pandemic i was playing basically thursday to sunday most weekends in local bars and clubs and some warehouses spaces here and there and then post-pandemic things have kind of quieted down and essentially all those bars and pubs I was playing it have basically realized that they could basically just have a spotify dj play or have a decent playlist and they don't need to really book many DJs to play and it's kind of nice because it's a bit of waste of money especially since the turnout for most of these places isn't as much as it was pre-pandemic also so there's a lot of things going around there a lot of a lot of things so it's not really as easy to say hey you should just pull out do this whatever because people have family to support do you know what I mean it's just hard to say I don't know I just think I think it's a little bit unfair and a little bit immature and naive on Nash's point of view in my opinion but also I respect her because she's clearly fighting a good fight and clearly believes in this issue wholeheartedly it's fighting for Ukrainian justice is keeping the the war over there alive on social media on her end of things by reminding people constantly even if it's not in the local if it's not in the current news rotation so she's doing her bit as much as she can and holding her friends to account but i just think it's in, it's kind of in bad taste to do stuff like this calling him out like this is a bit weird but again maybe there's more to the story than we know i was going through some process to making a mess with nina opening conversations with cancellation of some festivals collecting money from my fund besides personal stuff which was even more messy including daria in the end of april i started to work to rebuild the lineup of my ncheo showcase at the hall which was confirmed for the program in january 2022 the lineup was supposed to be kolaho kolaha um ben Benjinek, Live, Gail, me and Daria back to back. I realized this lineup is impossible because nobody could make besides me and Daria. Since I introduced her to the app, to, to it up Kyle, we have the chat and telegram and I wrote that they need to be support and asked if they could play their back to back because I wanted to keep the lineup 100% Ukrainian for a reason. Sergei refused it straight away, but Daria got, oh, so who's Sergei? Sergei, I guess is it up Kyle. Why does he call himself Eat Up Kyle if his name's Sergei? Sergei's a better name than Eat Up Kyle, isn't it? Okay, maybe uh, continue. Um, Sergei refused straight away, but Dario got even worse. First, she said she forgot about it. Then she said she needs to check the flight schedule. So she had that on red. <laughs> Imagine the person that you introduced to your agents. You took around to all the best managers. You got them sets and boiler room. You did all that stuff. And then they start, they, they leave you on red and stuff. I understand why Nash is pissed. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I get it honestly dj world is fucking brutal man one minute you're up and everyone wants to wants to wants to suck your pussy next minute you're down and no one wants to be associated with you because you're bad for business it's fucking brutal uh, Dario got even worse she said she forgot about it then she said she needs to check her flight schedule for that weekend as she was going to Colombia for her gig so maybe that would be reason for her not to play hall as we agreed I was like fine as we have the same agent I'm going to ask him myself oh come on Nasty, you fucking knock Oh, what a snitch. Gross. Proper cop energy. I'm going to ask myself, and I did already feel she was looking for an excuse to pull out. Next day, I texted her saying I've checked her flights and she has no problem playing at all on the 18th as a flight to the 19th. At that point, I already felt like she was taking me for the red alert emotion, and I don't understand why, after all I've done for her, after calling her my sister, uh, after <laughs> not taking people that can honestly because i don't have this in, i don't have this ability to cry like this online i don't even have this ability to cry this in, in my private personal life i just dust things off you can't take things personal especially comes to industry stuff you cannot take it personally business is business 
but I would never in my wildest dreams be crying at about something, especially I wouldn't want to give somebody the the satisfaction that they've hurt me this much. I wouldn't want them to know that they've disappointed me this level. I wouldn't want them to even to know. I'll keep it to myself and cry into my pillow, facing into it, like, <laughs> muffledly. But I wouldn't want to let anyone know that this is actually how I felt because, God damn it, Nasha, you are bearing it all out here, innit? It seems that she actually wanted to be, you know, she's probably jealous of Etap Kyle. Does she want to be in a ship with, with fucking Dario or what? What's going on here? It's a bit weird. After doing nothing wrong or bad to her, I must ask, what, apart from blasting her online and shit and always telling her to post stuff? I don't know. Um, I, ask, I, I must ask for lunch as a favour. Wasn't it so easy to be my friend and to be there when I needed it? This talk happened on April the 22nd. A month before our horse show and showcase was happening, just two days before BD, which was I also reminded her, um, telling her that not to do this for me. Her answer was, I don't have motivation. I'm playing old tracks. I don't search for new music. I'm in a bad mood. Well, how selfish is that? Who is in a... Who is in a good mood now? Is she telling me this to me? She still had one month ahead to make an effort to create a good set. She made me feel like I'm walking around her with an open hand like a beggar. <laughs> but what the fuck? Is it really happening? Was I that stupid not to see who I'm helping to? Was I that blind in trust I can see a fool use me like that? I know why she said no to me about whore. She is just afraid not to be able to repeat such a random success with her first whore set which received 1 million views. Oh, come on. Now she's, so she, well, she's saying she didn't want to go on a second time because she was afraid he wouldn't get as many views. Huh? That's a weird thing. Would you want to repeat the success or just show that you're that lit and get two million? She said she, she, so she simply didn't want to play for me to keep using the success of one promoting herself. Fair enough. She doesn't understand such a thing is happening just a few times in life of an artist and it's not a formula. It's just an algorithm which, make, which takes some content or higher results. Whatever set she will play next time, it won't even be close to the success she got with the first. She's cut contrary to herself. She just said here that it's algorithms. It's not always about you, but then said the next one won't be successful as well. Like, God damn it. It's an illusion to think I got famous because it's genius or special. It's just a lucky moment. I got similar moments throughout my 17 years of my career. I know how that works. Business over friendship. Realizing that we was not able to do such a small thing for me. I needed to make me feel sick. In the beginning, I got angry. You are angry. You're still angry now. But she didn't want to talk. She said, let's move this conversation to tomorrow. Then she was silent for the next four days. <laughs> honestly how brutal was it to leave her leaving somebody unseen that's done that much for you that she's you know i don't know if this she did as much as she says but still brutal then i was like wow i cannot believe it maybe i don't understand something so i texted her again the lack of understanding was all over our chat i didn't know how to behave when we gonna meet in belgium where daria and sergey played back to back before me following the saturday the 30th of april i told her we need to talk personally in real life and just two of us i offered her two options to meet in ghent before our gig or berlin on monday the may 1st having two opportunities to fix our friend relationship in a personal conversation on saturday the 30th she asked me to move our meeting to monday the 1st and end texting me on the phone on may the 2nd said hello can you speak now since then coward daria Cavosa doesn't exist to me <laughs> coward daria um well i felt like the mirror in my wonderland got broken hard reality reached my front mind i had to go through lots of pain about it yes my fault yes i was stupid yes i was wrong and silly about her this is my problem bro this sounds way too she's way too emotional about this girl is there some sort of like lesbianic energy going on here? Did she really like fall in love with this girl slightly and didn't really realize her until she got up, she got hooked up with Etap Kaya or something? This is bizarre, man. This is super possessive. Like she doesn't owe you anything. Like a response, a reply, a meeting. It's a good thing if she does give it to you as a friend, don't get me wrong, but she doesn't owe you that. And sometimes you get the message. Sometimes people don't want to tell. It's like I had it before. I said it before plenty of times. I think. You know, on one side, I can agree because I said that plenty of times on this podcast. I think sometimes a friendship breakup is way more hurtful than a relationship breakup because I think relationships, you kind of know in your head that there's a possibility that it could go to the aisle or it could just end. There's a possibility, right? You could move away. They could move away. They could pass away. Things could move, whatever. You could just, you know, end up having a lot of space in between, not meeting, blah, blah, blah. Things change. 
Um, but relationship, sorry, but friendship breakups are horrible because you never think you're never going to lose a friend. You think friends are going to be around forever. Even if you don't speak for ages, like I've got friends from school and from uni that I don't speak to every day. I speak to maybe once or twice a year, but if I meet them up in public and we go out to a bar somewhere, it's like, it's like we were back in uni days. We can speak for hours and hours and hours and hours. So you never think it's going to end. But when they do end, like I've had a couple where people came up to me and said, hey, or text me and said, hey, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Stop texting me. And that pain is something that I can't even describe how that feels when someone tells you, I don't want to talk to you anymore as a friend. Not even sexually, nothing to do with it. Just a friend. I don't like you anymore. Go away from me. Delete my number. You don't exist. That can hurt a lot. But sometimes as well, it's your own fault because... There are sometimes messages or signs that are laid beforehand that aren't as painful because sometimes people don't want to be jerks, right? They just want to let you down easily. So they do sometimes give you messages and signs and stuff that you can basically ascertain that, hey, that's not really the friend I used to have beforehand. And just let it lie. But keep pushing it and pushing it. Sometimes you get put in this position where suddenly you get a, a real stark reminder that you are not their priority at all. They don't care about you one bit. Get, get away from me. Leave me alone. And I also think as a grown up, as a woman, you know what I mean, she's, she's a woman with a husband and a kid and stuff. This is very embarrassing, like very embarrassing. You should be busy. You've got a kid to look after. You've got a household to keep steady. You've got a career going. You've got a label and stuff like you should be way more preoccupied about those things than worrying about some girl that you met in 2019. Like this is a bit, this is a bit lame, really lame. Um, Da, 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 continues i was being so kind and open one door to my heart another door to my intentional success the diary was not there when i needed her she couldn't support me on some basic levels D relax this is about the politics thing it's not about her not being there as a friend the politics things happened at the same the russia the, the war with russia and ukraine happened at the same time that diary kind of got with the cast maybe the timing was a bit off but this is more so of her not being super super pro ukraine and kind of raging on anyone online and attacking everybody and going after nina kravis and posting things all the time you're allowed you're allowed not to do that if you don't want to maybe she just wants to have her social media be a kind of safe space a place where she can kind of escape from all that stuff that's happening every day because it's her country and she knows people there blah 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 i don't know whoever the happening i just think this is really childish personally for me some people told me nasha don't do it and let it go you are higher than this no you're not you're not higher than this you're a fucking bizarre lady life will teach her and she will face her karma experiencing the same shit in the future what, what about your karma for going from fucking playgraves are you gonna get karma for that or not but i can't handle it and i don't want to let it go and close my eyes to it it's still in my power to speak about it i speak to still about her now it's too comfy for her and uh, no see this is this is what i don't like she wants to counsel them. She wants them to what, have no career because they didn't post flags on their fucking feed or something. You have to chill out. But let's just see it again. What is this? Sorry, let's go again. But I can't handle it. And I don't want to let it go and close my eyes on it. It's still in my power to speak out about her. It's too comfy for her and her husband who definitely participated in our breakup, surely giving bad advices and using diary stupidity. <sighs> and love to him in order to make us separate and hurt me yo i think she was in love with daria i honestly do think that she was in love with her she didn't know it until etap kyle got involved this is so weird just for personal reasons she was still using help from my agent with whom i built platform for people like her collecting contacts and building up a relationship with promotes for over 10 years of course she's gonna use her agent you gave it to her well, that's what agents for no she's a good dj though but nothing more primitive selfish opportunities with no honor people with no position slippery cunning primitive entrepreneurs i want to ask you all never associate her with me and me with her she lost my respect and she even turned to be disgusting she's 100 fast food entertainer without personality for me i don't like this this is like when guys this is like no this is like when girls sleep with guys and then afterwards they say oh he's ugly anyway he had a small dick but you still let him fuck you this is the same thing when guys do the same thing with a girl when she breaks up with them oh she's tall whatever da, da, da. she sucked a million dicks yeah but you still wifed her up you can't turn around after the fact and then start calling a fast food entertainer. You invested all the time into her. You gave her all your contacts. You essentially gave her your flipping kidney. I mean, she was basically a daughter to you or a sister that you never had, whatever it may be. Come on, man. Now she's fast food entertainer. With that personality for me, there's no connection between us two. It's not the first time when I'm facing disappointments in my life, when I'm too kind to some people and naive about her feelings to me. Um, this is the price for initiative and trust and I'm paying it fully I, I really love and believe in people and humans 
yeah, all right. Life is teaching me hard to stop believing my dream about humanity and finally become a rational strategist, not a noble. F Yo, this person, she is so full of herself. Not a noble figure who engaged in endless charity. Go and jump off a cliff, Nastya. What shit are you talking right now? But I have an urgent need for justice, yeah, all right? But this is what promoted me to write this text. I can't get over the fact that so much of the ugly truth about one person is left behind the scenes. So she wants to be the person to uncover everyone's ugly truths. She, she, like, you have to be careful, man. Once you, like, don't throw stones in a glass house, mate. You don't want people to start uncovering your ugly truths. I can't afford to ignore this and keep quiet. I know how much of you will react to this. This is shock content, another unpleasant kind of story associated with Nastia, but it's much more important for me to tell the truth sometimes you just need to shut the fuck up man than to think about the consequence of action it's very interesting though for a, for an eastern european or for a central european usually you think of them as being very stalwart very stoic they kind of internalize their pain a lot i mean you, that's the kind of impression you get but she she's giving very um very kind of western kind of personality traits isn't it? in terms of like center of attention sharing too much information victim complex like it's never my fault. You, incredibly narcissistic. Maybe I'm I'm wrong because maybe that's how East European men, women and men are. But I always get the impression that they're very cold. They're very kind of emotionless, or they kind of deal with their emotions behind closed doors. They don't talk about certain things in public. Um, do you know what I mean they're very kind of mature? In they kind of mature in early age. It kind of feels like. But she seems like a big baby. This, you wouldn't imagine this lady had like a, a daughter with a husband and shit. You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't imagine it at all. This is a big woman. But it's much more important to me than that. Da, 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 da. Um, I can't get over the fact that so much of the ugly truth about one person is left behind the scenes. It's just not fair. <laughs> this woman's horrible, man. She wants to end her career because she didn't, honestly, because she didn't return a text or she didn't want to do a back-to-back -back set, a fucking horror or something. Like, come on, relax. I can't afford to ignore this and keep quiet. And I know most of you will react to this. This is, I, I cannot, I cannot insist on you. I cannot insist on you not working with her or affect her own choices, but I definitely don't suggest you work with diaries without agreements on papers. Yo, you guys are, this is awful. This is awful, man. What are you doing, Nastia? She's taking things for granted and she's not able to pay her bills. She kind of person who will betray you for personal interest and will not give a fuck about you um, after you give a fuck about her. But I've done all DJs do this. This isn't, isn't this the, the 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 most operandi of most people that get on stage and do this kind of job from what I've assessed anyway. She has no values and rules only for beneficial collaboration. Fixed on paper could work. Um, don't believe in solidarity and trust working with such people. This is a warning. <sighs> so who do you guys believe who's in the who's in the right here who's in the wrong Nasha versus um dario Cavosa and etap cow an absolute shit show of an affair personally my finishing thoughts on this are Nasha is a big raging DJ, big raging baby and an incredible drama queen to go to this extent to somebody and attack them because they didn't respond to the war in ukraine the same way that you wanted to respond to the war in ukraine which has been a very aggressive somewhat somewhat people will suggest it's you basically trying to repair your reputation after all the hurt, abuse that you got through the playgrave stuff but again i'm not going to be that cruel and i'm going to extend some courtesy and say maybe benefit the doubt because it was something that affected you directly and it was something that came out of the blue that suddenly a kind of charitable side of you woken up and you went to take action cool that's on you but it doesn't mean everyone else has to react the same way and the fact that she's now bemoaning and kind of criticizing her for getting into a relationship and ignoring her and not having Nasha be the center of her attention is just absolutely wild and then at the end basically telling people to not book her because she's not a good person to her only is absolutely insane also ridiculously insane especially in the economy that we're in now especially with this current state affairs of the way there are now it's just insane to try and get somebody's you know food taken away from their table because you don't like how they acted towards you or because they left you on red or seen or something it's just absolutely insane ridiculously insane ridiculously childish but again on another side of things if you are that politically motivated and you do think it's important to speak up about what's happening in ukraine and you do think it's important to make a stand against russian artists who are being quiet about putin and whatnot then maybe if somebody like a Daria comes across your purview and she's wanting to be politically correct, maybe it's beneficial to kind of, you know, 
distance yourself from them and take them out of your peer group fair enough but it doesn't mean you go to the extent of trying to cancel them because they're not agreeing with you they expose themselves because now you know that you see what the true colors are but it doesn't mean you have to kind of go out your way to make sure everybody knows that they're a piece of shit because they don't agree with your politics that's fucking insane really really is but again maybe i'm in the wrong what do i know let me know in the comments down below if you agree or if you disagree next on the list here i want to talk about quickly was what oh what i talking about here was that it was that it or something else um, i think that might be it for now i think that might be it yeah i think that might be it for now for now that might be it for now that might be it we'll have to end it from now let's just or maybe talk about this clearly should we um so as most of you know oh yeah it's always quickly as most of you maybe know from this podcast i think i've updated it beforehand that brendan babsian the founder of noah and the former design director of supreme or creative director i forgot what it was his actual title but he did some really amazing stuff at supreme and then obviously at the same time he also had noah i think it was called another name what was it what's called another name before it I think it was called something else. I forgot the name of it. Then he was at Supreme. Then he kind of paused the brand, similar to what you know Jason Dill did with fucking awesome. He sort of paused the brand and kind of restarted it later on when he sort of left Supreme. And now he's got a new job heading up J Crew, and he's basically been tasked with trying to resuscitate J Crew because it's been essentially you know on the on the sidelines for a very very long time on life support, struggling for air, struggling for any sort of relevancy, and you know getting Brendan Babson involved. I think was a really bit of a master show, especially considering J. Crew's aesthetic and considering what kind of, you know, Brendan's about when it comes to design and his codes and stuff. I thought it would be a really great marriage and something that would actually make some sense. But having seen the stuff, I'm not really too sure if it's all that great. Maybe it's because of the style, maybe because of the editorial itself, but it looks a little bit mediocre. And I don't know if this is because in general, I've been a little bit underwhelmed with what Brendan's done with Noah in recent years. It feels like it's kind of gone by the wayside. I'm not really too sure why, maybe because they've expanded their offerings they're doing a lot more pieces now so maybe more of his creative juices are being spread across many different things so you're not getting as many hits as you were in the beginning when they were only doing really small collections maybe it's because my eyes are now used to the Noah aesthetic that's now been copied by many different brands so I'm kind of not it's not as special as it once was prior maybe because my taste levels have just evolved maybe because I'm just being overcritical I don't know or maybe because I'm blind there's something about Noah that just doesn't hit the same as it does before in the past and having looked at this new um pieces coming from j crew under brendan babijan's um tutelage it doesn't look like there's much there that's really really kind of gonna make me run to the stores to kind of grab some stuff there's some okay pieces here and there but nothing crazy that's really gonna make me go goo goo gaga so the first picture we've got a sort of salmon pink uh mohair type sweater over a pinstripe um of a striped yellow and blue shirt with some acid wash jeans and some nice penny loafers so a typical what you'd say kind of um noah look in that respect right taking something classic and then applying a little twist on it a little bit of a funk to kind of you know swag it up a little bit so typical noah in that respect then you've got this um look here number two which is essentially a version of a chore jacket maybe you'd say with like a paisley print shirt some nice pants and again some decent loafers with a strap on them so again nothing that i'm really too enamored with look free you've got a what's what do you call that uh rang line sleeve jumper with a sort of met with sort of pattern on there over some flannel shirt with another sort of pinky salmon type pant here like a chino with another sort of buckle ugly shoe thing going on there you've got some more prints there the print there with the jacket the, oh, the interesting thing here is the return of the new balances because i'm not sure if you guys remember but back in the day j crew used to do some really interesting new balances collaborations i don't know why but for whatever reason every season they'd have really decent j crew collaboration new balances um which was really strange to see so did j crew new balance right there were weird ones over the years that just didn't make any sense like they just kind of popped up out of the blue like every season there'd be a, a specific sort of j crew only new balance that kind of appeared out of the blue out of the blue out of the blue out of the blue and they came to see keep them consistent and they used also used to be j crew nikes like classic like they'd always used to take like really classic silhouettes like ldvs and stuff like that if i remember correctly yeah see like yeah like all courts um, no sorry all courts like kill shots 
um what other ones they did yes they did see they did um they did uh what was it one that's i forgot what that one's called there they got cortez see they got different sort of um ones they did in the past which are really really cool so it's cool to see that kind of coming back again because i think that's a really cool introduction and hopefully will give a different sort of flavor to what we have in terms of new balance offerings especially from the likes of like amelie on door but the look itself i'm not really for that striped long sleeve whatever and those shorts i just don't like anything about it and that picture as well it looks kind of muddy in it i'm not really a fan of it at all in that respect we continue on this red um this red kind of what do you, what do you call it this red work jacket is sublime maybe the favorite piece i think i've heard of it it looks like it's made out of some sort of felt um that's really nice to be honest um with the shirt with the striped shirt tucked into a pair of jeans and uh and the shoes there selvage denim this looks really nice this is a really nice look i gotta be honest this is really especially with a little golden retriever with a little jumper around it that's a really nice look with that red jacket um then you've got another look here with like a waistcoat and some jeans and some so the whole thing there's loads of sockless looks on the end which i'm not really a fan of this parka is fucking banging but again i'm always a sucker for a good parka with some good chest pockets here on the front do you know what i mean i'm always going to be a down for that um they got some good um what do you call the mountain boot type things with the red laces and a brown suede typical sort of mountain look kind of you know makeup there um the knit jumper i'm not really too fond of as well that doesn't really do much for me um got some big baggy jeans here look with again with the sockless like it's a very specific look they're trying to go through with j crew right very americana um yeah i'm not this flannel jacket thing looks decent i guess for the most part but again you could get that jacket from uh, many many different brands out there in the market there is it really that much of an offering to really make you rush to the stores to go cop it i'm not really too sure there's a contrast panel type shirt thing going on there. that's probably quite interesting a lot of people will probably be into especially some of the streetwear lot it's got you know one sleeve looks like one pattern one sleeve is one pattern pocket the different i mean that's all well good there you've got a nice the suit looks fairly decent this is probably my favorite favorite look overall this suit look is really nice you've got this kind of what material is it? i don't know what it is it looks like a suede or something or maybe corduroy i don't know what that is there but it's like in a dark olive green color like a bottle green with like these really great loafers which are in suede too the socks can go the striped socks i don't really like that with that look and a nice like pinkish shirt with a weird paisley tie i think those colors work really well together i just don't like the socks um up oh, good up again do, 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 do. 13 of that in it right uh the socks there next one we've got a typical j crew look which is fairly decent again with the uh body warmer type thing going on there with a over, over, over a green jumper with a c logo on it and some what are they corduroy work pants or something along those lines of and some classic like court sneakers yeah man a lot of this stuff doesn't really hit for me man personally some of the suit jacket and stuff are nice this kind of uh gray blazer type thing going on there's pretty nice with those slacks those look quite nice and what she's wearing looks okay i guess but styling and the editorial itself just doesn't hit home for me in that regard doesn't doesn't this isn't the offering or the introduction i thought jk would have it looks fairly fairly boring i'm not gonna lie I don't know again, is it Brenda? Has he Brenda lost a sauce the same way that Ricardo Tisha lost a sauce at Burberry? You see what Ricardo Tisha is doing at Burberry now, you're like, Jesus Christ, this surely can't be the same designer that set trends and, you know, whatever it may be when he was at Givenchy, man. Like, this can't be the same dude, can it? And maybe this just happens over time, innit? You, you, you know what I mean? So much of your juice gets given to your own brand over season of season, you have to make hit after hit, and you just miss a couple of times. Whatever these shoes are, these are really nice. I like these. These look really, really nice. I forgot what they're called, a particular style, but these are very nice. I like that. It's like a brown suede with this sort of um, leather sort of uh, contrast around there, the seam. I really like that. I really, really do like that. And the jeans seem to fit a type, certain type of way as well, especially with the length. Maybe because this girl's got really great legs, but the jeans fit her fucking perfectly with no alterations. That's fucking cool to see. But it just doesn't hit as much as I thought it would, man. There's a lot of hype around this kind of um, reintroduction. The hats look fairly good. I'd wear the fuck out of the hats. Okay, that's pretty clever. Each hat's got a letter of the, the brand, so J. Crew. So if you wanted to, you could buy each one, which would probably be a good thing to have in your collection. J. Crew. Um, the hats are probably the favorite thing and that kind of olive 
that kind of and maybe this look actually going back on it this look is probably one of the standout ones as well with the cream with the acid wash and stuff that's a look you could easily copy in your wardrobe and make work again but the rest of it is really underwhelming i have to say man really 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 underwhelming i'm not really a fan of it at all introduction of the new balance is nice obviously that red jacket here that i liked is good look number six but again that red work jacket you can get that anywhere this green parker thing that i like is again something you could easily pick up in uniqlo it's not something that crazy to go you know to go be paying j crew money to go and purchase the hats are pretty decent and then this kind of olive green suit number thing is quite nice but i'll actually change it some details but apart from that fairly underwhelming from brendan babson's debut at j crew um the first offering of the Brendan Babijan Signature J Crew Collection will be available online with more stars arriving from August the 16th. So if you want it, check it out, I guess, isn't it? If you want it, check it out, I guess. Um, And that might be it for Agostino Zinger. Thanks so much for checking out for the tuning in or tuning out tuning in for the agassino zinger show episode number 589 it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if it's your first time checking out my show via youtube you know what to do slash like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you listen via the podcast set please leave me a five star review and i'll be really really grateful about that and all that malarkey there's my website and there's links to to check out all my stuff that i do social media links i'm also playing a dj set at the what you call it brixton jam on this saturday on the 30th of july so if you're around you'd like to hear some disco from me then definitely come and check me out there i'll be doing a dj live stream probably this wednesday too so if you want to check out me playing and see what i sound like definitely check out that stream as well and i'll be picking up everything else later on in the week with you as well guys i'll be doing hopefully a live stream for the random show if you're a fan of that too check that out on that regard but until next time it's been a pleasure to have your company thank you for welcoming me back with open arms i'll see you guys again very soon peace